Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's briefing on a climate security plan for America. My name is Carol Werner. I am the executive director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute, EESI. And we are an independent nonprofit started by a bipartisan congressional caucus 35 years ago to inform policymakers and to search for sustainable common sense solutions to key energy and environmental problems of our day. I think that today's briefing is especially timely given all of the attention that is focused uh, to our north at the UN Climate Week in New York City. We also saw huge numbers of people in terms of climate strikes around the world raising attention to this very, very important issue around which we are going to have important discussions this morning. I want to say that I am delighted that we are partnering once again with the Center for Climate and Security. This has been a wonderful, strong partnership. We believe so strongly in so many of the same issues, values, and the importance of what we can learn through a better understanding of how climate, its impacts, how that affects our national security in so many different ways. So at this time, I'd like to turn to my colleague, John Conger, who is the director of the Center for Climate and Security. How are we doing this morning? Good? Everybody do well on the metro this morning? I, I understand that we had some accidents and some problems. Uh, but in the end, uh, you're all here. We, uh, and for those watching online, uh, hopefully you weren't impacted either. I, I thank you, Carol, for uh, your kind introduction. Uh, I'm John Conger. I'm, with, uh, I'm the director of the Center for Climate and Security. Uh, we also really uh, value our partnership with Carol and EESI. Uh, Carol, uh, uh, you may or may not know, is leaving as the executive director uh, of uh, EESI, but will stay with the organization, she tells me. But I just wanted to take the opportunity at the outset of this particular forum to say thank you to Carol and to all of the great partnership we've had from you. So thank you so very much. Um, uh, keeping with the theme of thank yous, I, I also wanted to thank uh, our funders, the uh, Henry M. Jackson Foundation and the David Rockefeller Fund for their support for the efforts that, that we have uh, gone forward and for, and for this report. Um, I also have to say thank you to Congressman Adam Smith for sponsoring the room for us today. Now, I, it, I, I mentioned that not just because I want to say thank you for the room, which, which we really appreciate, but, but also because I want to point out he's chairman of the Armed Services Committee. This is a national security topic. This is not an environmental uh, group that works on, on a security topic as a side issue. This is a security group that works on an environmental issue. So think about that, and that's your framing for today, for all the things you're going to hear about today. This is, we're looking at this from a national security perspective uh, and dealing with a very difficult uh, issue. So as you, as you look at the agenda for today and as we uh, think about what we're going to hear, you're going to have, uh, we're going to lead off today with a keynote address from General Ron Keyes. Uh, I'm going to introduce him in a moment, uh, but he is a warfighter's warfighter who's going to be able to give you a perspective uh, on, on this issue in the intersection of climate and national security. We're going to have uh, a panel of distinguished uh, security experts who are going to talk about the impact of uh, climate change on our military, uh, just to sort of give you the baseline from which we're operating, setting, setting up the problem. So panel one is setting up the problem. Panel two is going to be talking about our solution. We have uh, a climate security plan for America that we are publishing today. Uh, there are copies of it outside. You can also get it online, but we, you know, killed a tree in, in, in order to uh, get you copies, hard copies here, because sometimes you just have to hold it in your hands. Well, there's plenty to hold in your hands out there. Um, so our climate security plan is talking about now that we have recognized the problem, what do we need to do about it? And we're going to get into that in more detail. I'm not going to, to do too much talking about that now, but the crux of it is that we need leadership. We need, uh, now that we've acknowledged the problem, we need leadership to move the ball forward. And we have offered uh, dozens of recommendations in our plan of things that we think that the administration should do. And obviously, if, if folks up here on Capitol Hill want to pursue uh, any of those recommendations through legislation, that would always obviously be up to them. Um, 
uh, hint, hint. Um, the, the, uh, so now, uh, uh, with no further ado, uh, let me uh, turn to introducing our keynote speaker. Uh, general Ron Keyes is a uh, retired four-star general, uh, Air Force general, after, and he retired after a career of more than 40 years in the Air Force. You're going to catch a theme here today of, of decades of military service from, from our, the folks that, we're, that we have speaking. Um, but, but General Keyes uh, retired as the Air Combat Command commander. Uh, so he was overseeing all of the Air Force's combat power. And he brings that perspective to, to this discussion. He's a warfighter. He had 4,000 hours piloting combat aircraft and 300 hours in combat. And at ACC, he commanded 1,200 aircraft, 27 wings, 17 bases, and 105,000 personnel. Now, uh, among those bases that he commanded uh, include some of them, some of the ones that are impacted and endangered by climate change and extreme weather. So he has uh, not only the combat uh, perspective that he's bringing to bear, but also the managing bases that are impacted uh, by climate change as well. Uh, he also is a member of our advisory board at the Center for Climate and Security, and he's chairman of the CNA, the Center for Naval Analysis Military Advisory Board, uh, which has done a lot of great work in this space as well. So uh, with no further ado, because you don't want to hear from me, you want to hear from him, let me uh, welcome up to the stage uh, General Ron Keyes. I was raised on a farm. I was educated as an entomologist, trained as a fighter pilot. I like to hunt, play golf, and I raised honey bees. And there's a wildly embellished story about a Dutch giraffe out there. <laughs> and I'm here to see the Climate and National Security Force. And if that doesn't underscore how holds up this issue is, I don't know what that is. So what I do know after 40 years in the Air Force, all around the globe, is how the military frames the problem. The prime directive is this. We go and fight and win America's wars, and we're called upon to do so. Whether that war is global vigilance, humanitarian rescue, or active combat. So that we owe America's sons and daughters the best equipment, the best plans, the best training and leadership we can if they are called to harm's way. We hire commanders to win, not explain to be. And that's why DOD cares about this. For us, this is not the religion of politics, a big or small government. Now can you hear me? Big or small government, liberal or conservative views, or being a climate scientist. This is for us about the religion of math. This is about resilient basing, effective training, more fight, less fuel, more capability, less cost, more options, less risk. We have to be able to base and train and test, mobilize, deploy, and reach back effectively without interruption, and have the cap capacity to be in many places at once, office, often at very short notice. That for us makes uh, climate change effects a double-edged sword. First, the planning for the direct impacts of climate change that are increasingly not just over there, but here. Sea level rise, flooding, wildfires, droughts, increased extreme heat days, record precipitation, and Arctic ice melt are impacting operations and base readiness. Now the same could be said about your village, town, city, by the way, so you might look at how we look at the problem for the problems that you face. And we encourage that because we don't just live in the ports and the forts and the bases. 
we live in all of the communities around our country. And so we are concerned not only with the milita military capability, but our homes, our cars, our kids, our livelihoods. Now second, climate change is the catalyst for accelerating crises all over the world, including here at home. Forced migrations, environmental disasters, failing states, all the potential to threaten critical infrastructure, drive instability, embolden competitors and adversaries, and become hotspots with potential for our involvement. Our market is expanding. We would just as soon that market not expand. Now, being in the military, we accept is a risky business, but we try not to take reckless chances. So our framework is a pragmatic, how bad could it be? Could we stand that? What could we do at what cost and what time frame? And what if we're wrong? And how will we know we're wrong? And how will we know we're wrong in time to go to plan B? And what is plan B? Again, I commend that sort of approach to looking at the problems that we all face. Along with uh, Covey's quote, the main thing is to keep the main thing as the main thing. And that's one of the big problems we face in this problem. But DOD is hard at work. There are recommendations pouring in from ports and forts and bases around the globe. How to be more proactive so we not only evacuate from storms, but more effectively protect assets in place. And we have a term called survive to operate. Better training, equipping, and response and recovery teams. Addressing specialized response equipment. Hardening emergency and crisis action facilities. Developing the ability to island facilities from commercial support. Changing our process even down to the way we flow our spare parts. So bases that are affected by major hurricanes can be more productive in the off season and better protect assets when the chance of damage is highest. The complete so the solution is going to take time and money and continued focus, but DOD clearly sees Mother Nature as a peer adversary. But that's resilience. Now, that didn't cure anything. And here's the problem. This is about national security, not just military security. It's a Rubik's Cube of technical, social, economic policy and politics, with technical maybe the least of the problem. Economic, energy, agricultural, and a host of other securities make up national security. DUNI cannot fix this problem. We may be, as you hear, the single largest user of energy, but that's only 1.7 of America's energy budget. If DOD goes out of business tomorrow, we're still in deep chemistry. We can be thought leaders. We can prove out mission-relevant technology. We can be clear-eyed on the threat. But remember the prime directive. We go and win. In our Climate and Security Advisory Group report, the Climate and Security Plan for America, we lay out four imperatives. And it's for a whole-of-government approach. One is demonstrate leadership, because unity of command is essential. The problem with that, of course, is everybody believes in unity of command as long as they're unity. Everybody wants to drive the train, but we've got to have leadership. You can't blow an uncertain trumpet and have everyone follow you. Everybody, everything can't be a priority, and somebody's going to have to pay the bill. Assess climate risks is number two. Forewarned is forearmed. Support allies and partners. We think that's important because an ounce of prevention is worth a ton of deployment orders. Prepare, prepare for and prevent climate impact. Uh, that's hard choices ahead. And I think that fourth one is the hardest and the most important. And we're already late. We, we say two things mainly in point number four. Build U.S. resilience to climate change risks 
and reduce their scale and scope. Now, who would argue with that? Certainly not Houston, not Omaha, or Paradise, Paradise California. Second, in the U.S. and globally, reduce greenhouse gas emissions at a scale necessary for both avoiding catastrophic security consequences and bolstering economic development. Here we go. When I say the dreaded phrase greenhouse gas emissions, that means someone's ox is going to get gored. That means somebody's going to lose and somebody's going to win. That means all our lives are going to have to change, probably expensively. But what's the alternative to not doing that? That reminds me of the story about the chicken and the pig and breakfast. If you're having ham and eggs, just remember, the chicken was involved, the pig was committed. <laughs> are you the chicken or the pig on this issue? Finally, let me leave you with this anonymous quote as you think about this issue today. It was so much easier to blame it on them. It was bleakly depressing to think that they were us. If it was them, then nothing was anybody's fault. If it was us, what does that make me? After all, I'm one of us. I must be. I've certainly never thought of myself as one of them. No one ever thinks of themselves as one of them. We're always one of us. It's them that do the bad things. So thanks for listening to me, and don't forget to pig. I meant not to leave any time. Well, I'm going I'm to do this. Um, we, we do have some time. Uh, I think we're going to go for uh, 10 minutes or so. Uh, we can take some questions. So why don't, we, why don't we aim for about three questions here in the audience? I don't know. Do we have a roving microphone? We've got a roving microphone over here. So please raise your hand. Uh, and if you could identify uh, you know, who you're affiliated with, and, and, uh, that would be helpful. But um, let's take some questions for General Keith. One over here. Hello, my name is Michael. I'm with Representative Gil Uh We're talking today about the impacts of climate change on the military, specifically right now on the Air Force. And I was wondering, someone who's unfamiliar with those impacts, what are just brief impacts that we should be looking for um, and what we should be taking note of? Well, I mean, we've got a lot of bases that are down on the coast. We've got uh, Eglin sits down uh, at Fort Walton Beach. It's a, a real jewel in the crown of our testing environment. We've got lots of telemetry down there. When uh, storms come through there, we're at, we're at danger of losing both our uh, development test uh, outfit and our operational test outfit. I mean, that, that could be a big uh, impact. A lot of that stuff is hardened. It's out on the beach. We know it's going to get hit, but uh, when some of those breakers come in, they get uh, damaged. You look at Tyndall, obviously, another base down on the coast got hit squarely with a hurricane and essentially wiped it out. We're building it back now, and it will be a, uh, an example of how to build for, uh, for the future as far as, you know, you're going to safe haven a lot of your stuff that you can get out of there, but some things... If it hits at the wrong time, you're not going to be able to get all your birds out because they're going through periodic maintenance or, or they may be broken. And so you need to build uh, har essentially hardened aircraft shelters that are elevated so you have stuff that's safe. Now you look at Langley. And we, now we've got a bunch of uh, most of our uh, raptors up at Langley. Uh, Langley sets at seven feet above sea level to start. So it doesn't take much to get that place uh, underwater. When I was there, I was there as a lieutenant colonel, as a squadron commander of the e Eagle Squadron, uh, and then came back as the four-star in charge of it. And you could see that just in that span of time that we could get a good, strong nor'easter coming through, and we were three or four feet uh, deep in water in places on the base. And we could see that at high tide, we are starting to get uh, infiltration of seawater uh, on the base. You go across, uh, 
to Norfolk, and uh, Norfolk has got some serious problems in some of the housing areas, uh, which are uh, off base, just from a, during high tide, not be able to get through the water to get to get to the base to go to work. So those are the kind of the impacts. Then you go out west, the wildfires, I mean, it's not just civilian structures are getting burned. We're losing power, uh, we're losing some of our training ranges, and the other impact that you have is we have people on the fire lines, and so all Every person you have on a fire line is a person that can't go and do the job that we actually hired them to do uh, in the mil military. When we are down in uh, Houston, uh, we were doing uh, swift water rescue down in Houston. We're not really set up to do uh, swift water rescue, and when you do that, you need to have trained people or you're going to lose people getting uh, swept away. In fact, during that first, not this last, most recent uh, deluge down in Houston, but in the first one, we ended up rearranging our deployment schedule because we had people either affected and we couldn't get them out of town, or we had people deployed in there helping people sitting on their roofs, uh, rescuing them, so we couldn't deploy those units out uh, overseas in their uh, normal rotation. So those, that's the kind of uh, impact that we see, and, and people go, well, we just, you know, head to higher ground, you know, and that, that's going to be an interesting discussion when you walk into the senator from uh, State X and say, you know, this has been great being here, but we're going to head for higher ground and we're leaving the state. Uh, so there's got to be an understanding of you can mitigate to, uh, I mean, be resilient to a point, but at a point you can't be resilient anymore. So we need to start on the other. We need to slow this uh, climate change down and arrest it. That's the, I guess, the most most important impact. We've got one over here. Uh, I see one over back there, and one over here. And uh, that's probably more questions we're going to get to. Can you uh, go one, two, three here real quick? Let's take them all, all the questions, and then we'll let you go. Uh, if you need some extra air. Uh, you got to ask your question here, and go into your two, all three questions. You got to remember the questions then. Yeah. I'll um, I'm Riley. Um, I'm with the office of Senator Jean Shaheen. Um, earlier you mentioned how climate change creates more opportunities um, for conflict and involvement of the United States abroad. Uh, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to that and where those conflicts would be. Um, My name is Bethlehem, and I'm with the Center for Development and Strategy. Um, my question is, and not to sound alarming, but some scholars have argued that it might be uh, too late for small island states to um, uh, benefit from any measures in mitigating climate change now. And I was wondering, uh, since we mentioned working with allies, if there are any sort of, um, perhaps not preventative, but uh, mitigating um, measures that the U.S. is taking with its allies um, things like preservation of cultures and societies, histories, and things like that for, for smaller island states that, uh, that might face extinction. Hi, my name's Blake, and I'm at uh, Senator Kane's office. You mentioned that bases might be moving soon, so my question is, uh, what is the long-term plan for Navy bases, especially places like Norfolk that are pretty well established? So. I almost want to answer that one, but we'll let Daryl speak to that. So, so, um, uh, so climate and conflict, uh, helping small island states and uh, future state bases. <laughs> <laughs> well, I take base closure first. I mean. As we look at you know, ranking our bases and everything, that's one of, uh, I believe, and I'm not behind the green door on this, so don't everybody run out with their hair on fire that uh, we've got another round of BRAC uh, going on. But that's going to be one of the analyses that has to be done to say how much money do we pour into these bases uh, until you're throwing good money after bad. And is there a way that we can make, we can make the, the curves meet so that we're doing resilience over here while someone is starting to think about mitigation and slowing down the, uh, the effects. I mean, that's the hope, is that you build your levees high enough, you change your operating procedures well enough that you can then live 
through whatever happens, which we call surviving to operate. We know we're going to get attacked, but we're going to be still operate, maybe at a reduced level, uh, until somebody fixes this. Now, if somebody doesn't fix this, you know, then I don't know, and I don't know what the timeline is. But you can look at Norfolk, but you look at the port of Norfolk. I mean, uh, they're no better off than we are, and so there are a lot of people starting to worry about uh, how do how do we make this resilient enough to a uh, resilient to last? And what was the next one? Uh, conflict in an open calling and open uh, Ah, well, that's pretty easy. I mean, uh, the patterns of weather are, uh, change. Uh, you get des desertification. Uh, you don't have enough water to grow food. You have people up people that pick up and move and they're forced migrations and they go through areas where other people are and they want to settle there. I'm already here. I don't want you coming in here uh, and setting up camp because I have barely enough grass for my cattle, for example. Uh, you see that I'm moving to large mega cities. Uh, they're looking for a better life. They're looking to be able to do something. Uh, one of the, the problems that you have is then you have in a lot of these ungoverned spaces and the failing states, uh, groups that come together and say, well, look, the, the government's not taking care of you. Come with us. We can show you a better life. And they get radicalized, and the next thing they end up on our shores over here, or somebody's uh, shores, uh, with the intent to do harm to somebody. So there's a lot of that impact that we don't have. We're in a lot of places, we don't have enough water. If you don't have enough water, A, you, you really can't live, and B, you can't grow any crops. and your uh, livestock are going to die, which means there are going to be a lot of movement. Uh, and then the other, the other issues are we've been living here all our life, and all of a sudden we're now under three or four feet of water, and we can't live like that. And so we, now what do we do? And again, it's the push and shove of between the, the constituted government taking care of people and other people, other groups, showing how they, if you come with us, we can, in fact, take care of you better than the government. So there's a lot, I mean, a lot of impacts across the world. I mean, we'll eventually, if we go long enough, I think we're going to see it here. We'll have another Grapes of Wrath story in the United States. My l mom lived through the dust storms that swept through the country, and she's told me those horrible stories. I, I don't, we don't want to see that. But it's not just going to happen over there. It's going to gradually uh, happen all around the world. And the last one was island states. You know, it's a matter of, that's not a, you know, a military imperative. I mean, we get swept up into it because we provide humanitarian relief. But that's a, a State Department and, and uh, aid. And their venue is back through the, uh, back through the UN. Uh, and I think there's a couple of islands out there that are about to become, if they haven't already come, you know, the first environmental uh, uh, humanitarian uh, situation where they have lost essentially their country due to environmental uh, change, to uh, climate change. So that's not a direct, you know, we're not directly involved in that. We're we're in a a uh, ancillary mode when it comes to assisting. The other, the other issue is, you know, around the world we tend to think of, of the desert in the Middle East and Africa and places like that as because they have some very serious problems, but you start to look at some of the other areas which are getting more rain and they're getting flooding and you start to look at the Malaccan Straits and the area over in Southeast Asia. There's, there's plenty of issue for everybody. And our concern as the military is you know, we go and win, and part of that winning is humanitarian rescue and, and support when we're called upon to do so, but there's only capacity to be so many places and so many at, <coughs> at one time and still do the primary job, which is to deploy and uh, carry out our country's business in the military sense. So that's, the, that's our worry. If I could welcome up the first panel. And 
and, uh, and while folks are coming up and taking their seats, uh, let me just say a couple things about what you're going to hear from this first group here. I, um, I appreciate some of the questions because uh, it, it reflects the fact that what we need to, before we start the discussion about how you fix things is a little bit more discussion and description of what the problems actually are. How is climate change affecting national security? And that's what our first panel is going to, to discuss in more detail. Um, we are going to have a conversation about operational impacts. We're going to have a conversation about impacts to installations. We're going to have a conversation about what future missions might be assigned to the military in the context of climate change. Um, what do you do when there's a whole new ocean in the Arctic that the Russians want to take control over? How do you, how do you deal with those dynamics? And then, obviously, how do you deal with uh, the climate stresses and how it drives conflict around the world? As our, as our panel takes their seats, um, I, this is the kind of conversation we're going we're gonna to have uh, for the next hour or so. I'm going to um, introduce each, each of our panelists at the beginning, and then we're just going to go through and have each one give some remarks, and then we'll do some more questions afterwards. But this part of the conversation, um, think through, uh, these, these are the questions about what, what the problem set is. Um, I will say, if you want to talk about base closure uh, later, I'm, I'm going to be available. I used to own the base closure uh, portfolio at DOD when I was uh, the Assistant Secretary back in the last administration, so I can talk at length about BRAC if you really want to hear how it works. Um, so today's panelists, um, uh, we have, uh, first we have Lieutenant General John Castellaw, who served 36 years in the Marine Corps. He's a pilot who later oversaw all of Marine Corps aviation and uh, then the Marine Corps budget. So uh, 36 years of experience there in the Marine Corps. Uh, we have uh, Rear Admiral Ann Phillips. Uh, she's currently serving as the Special Assistant to the Governor of Virginia for Coastal Adaptation and Protection, served in Norfolk for a long time. Uh, during her 31-year Navy career as a surface warfare officer, she commanded uh, Destroyer Squadron and Expeditionary Strike Group 2, uh, which included all of East Coast amphibious forces. Uh, so 36 years, then 31 years of experience. We have uh, Breeder General uh, Jerry Galloway. He's a professor at the University of Maryland, a professor of civil and environmental engineering. Uh, he served 38 years in the Army, uh, including service as the dean of the academic board at West Point. Uh, so 31, 36, 38. I'm, done. I'm, I'm not actually going to try and do public math here. I'll, I'll, I'll move on. Uh, Joan Vandervoort served as a DOD civilian for 28 years in OSD and in the Army, uh, managing environmental and encroachment issues and impacts on military training. Uh, she served as the Deputy Director for Ranges, Sea, and Airspace in OSD's Readiness Office. So we're going to get ex uh, a lot of perspectives here, uh, practical perspectives on how uh, operations have been and are going to be impacted by climate change. And so with no uh, further ado, let me turn it over to General Castellaw. Thank you, John. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And thank you very much for putting my name on the back of this. Sometimes I get <laughs> You know, as uh, we talk about uh, climate's impact on security, it really, for me... Oh, make the green light come on, okay. For me, it started uh, growing up, uh, like General Keyes, I uh, grew up on a farm, and the determining factor in just about everything we did was the weather, it was the climate, uh, how we prospered from year to year depended to a great extent on, on what the weather was and, and the climate and how well the plants did under our care. And then I uh, got in the Marine Corps and uh, I became an aviator and uh, man, you better be careful about the, uh, the weather uh, when you're flying. And also, uh, as I got up into uh, the ranks and all, uh, we started uh, doing operations and being responsible for planning, and you better think about what kind of operating environment you're going to be in. So, uh, and then when I uh, transitioned, I went back to the farm. I'm third generation on a, 
in a 100-year-old farmhouse back in Tennessee, not far from the Mississippi River, and it is still a determining factor in uh, what we do in, in farming. And so uh, let me, I see Esther Babson out in the audience from uh, American Security Project. Let me try to steal, and I've never had an original thought in my life, and Denny can confirm that. Let me try to use what uh, ASP has put out in terms of a framework to think about this. And, and you start with sea level rise. And what we're talking about is impact on, on uh, our national security and on, on the military. I spent uh, about a third of my career in the Camp Lejeune Cherry Point complex in eastern North Carolina. Uh, and of course, you know, the Marines like to be near water. They like to have sand in their boots and, and to, uh, have a place to land. And if you look at Camp Lejeune, you know, it's a lot like all the other areas in the East Coast. You got barrier islands down there. And one area, the first place that I ever did an amphibious uh, landing was Onslow Beach, which is essentially a barrier island down there. But what we're already starting to see down in Camp Lejeune is an attack on those barrier islands. They're getting more severe. Uh, if we say 2035, we're going to see some additional overflow over those barrier islands. And then Camp Lejeune is wrapped around the New River, which is a very shallow inlet, broad inlet. And you can just see how the surge from uh, the waters during a storm or an increase, uh, as we're seeing in the uh, uh, sea level, is going to impact it because we put, you know, everybody likes to be right on the water. So you can see how all that infrastructure, and it's billions of dollars of in infrastructure that's going to be at, at risk down there. Uh, we go a little bit further south. Uh, when I commanded the 2nd Marine Aircraft Wing, I had Buford, South Carolina, which is a uh, fighter base. And uh, I tried to steal as much money from the Navy as I could to put into F-35s that we're going to base down there. And you look at how uh, threatened that Buford is going to be, and uh, you think about, okay, are we doing the right things in terms of where we're uh, doing our investments? And, uh, what do we need to do to mitigate the risk that are posed to such bases as Buford and Paris Island? You know, we just had this hurricane, and the first thing you have to do down in Paris Island is you, uh, because you've got one causeway that goes in and out is to get uh, several thousand uh, recruits on buses and get them out of, out of harm's way. Uh, so along the coast here, uh, everybody knows about Norfolk, uh, uh, but it, there are also other areas uh, that are under threat uh, from sea level rise. And let's talk about uh, extreme storms. Again, you know, I said I was a farmer. Well, you know, what we're seeing is an increase, I think that's uh, uh, 1880 when we started keeping this, the uh, uh, increase in the days of the year where we have more than two inches uh, of rain. And what does that mean? Well, when you get this flood, this increase in uh, rain flow, then it exceeds the capability of being able to handle it. Uh, and if you look at the Mississippi Basin, where I'm living now, and you look around, you see uh, places like Offutt, which is uh, on the Missouri River, uh, even uh, naval support activity, Memphis, uh, which was built during World War II and within the last 10 years has had to, uh, to deal with flooding uh, in their housing area and rebuild that. Uh, you talk about Fort Campbell, Fort Knox, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, uh, inland and far from the uh, uh, ocean and uh, sea level rise, they're subject to damage from uh, extreme events uh, flooding and, uh, and rainfall. One of the ways that I've confirmed that, besides being scientists, there's a, uh, a very, very suspect magazine that comes out every month. It has for 110 years. It's called The Progressive Farmer. And in it, every month, 
is a article on how we're going to have to do a better job of conservation uh, in growing crops because erosion is being accelerated by that increase in those rain events on doing that. And not only that, you know, one of the, the areas that uh, we, you know, we're dealing with tariffs and we're dealing with uh, uh, a downturn in uh, commodity areas, uh, one of the areas within the last 20 years in the U.S. that we've increased food production, uh, soybeans in particular, has been in South Dakota. And uh, what we're seeing now is with the uh, increase in the growing season, you're able to do that. That area also is in the uh, uh, Midwest is one of the areas where that we've had an increase, an annual increase in the amount of rain by eight inches on the average. You can you look at the graph and see that the trend has continued up to do that. Now the uh, third thing is extreme drought. Uh, I you know spent a lot of time. I, I'm, I broke the first promise I ever made to my wife I, uh, when I graduated uh, from University of Tennessee. I said, honey, three years and we're back on the farm and we stayed in for 36. She moved us 25 times around the world. But I was in UCOM, European Command in uh, Stuttgart, and at, back then we had responsibility for Africa and uh, I had the Africa portfolio and they said, hey, Castello, we may have a uh, a uh, coup down in Chad. We're going to send you down to get ready for a non-combatant evacuation operation. So I go down there and I go out and I look at the areas. I look at the Chari River and I fly over Lake Chad and I look at that. And, and this is an area of 40 million people in the Lake Chad Basin. 40 million people. And because of uh, of uh, instability from a number of things. It's always had under the layer there some situations, but it has increased in the recent years. I went back uh, two years ago and I had the opportunity to go over the same area and I was amazed at how much Lake Chad has gone down since I was there. And what we're talking about, an impact on a couple hundred thousand fishermen, on uh, farmers, on herdsmen, what's happening as the desert comes south and the lake dries up, you're pushing the herdsmen south into the uh, farming area and crop area and you're getting gunfights between herdsmen and uh, farmers, the fishermen are trying to figure out what they're going to do and in this environment you have Boko Haram who's recruiting individuals and undermining those nations down there that uh, their stability and eventually and eventually that instability uh, will impact us. Now Esther, what's the fourth thing? Ah, oh, Arctic ice melt. <laughs> Thank you, Esther. Arctic ice melt, uh, I was reading uh, the Military Times here this week. Uh, you know, we've had an sit interesting situation in, in the Korean Peninsula and uh, uh, we have suspended exercises on the Korean Peninsula. And what's happening is we've got Marines and, and sailors that are, instead of exercising in, on the Korean Peninsula, are sailing to Alaska to try to get cold weather operations in. And what they're finding there is, as the permafrost melts, is that you're getting erosion of the uh, coastal areas up there and, and inland. You're also, uh, as the uh, ice becomes water, it uh, destabilizes the foundation uh, for buildings and infrastructure that we've invested in uh, security-wise. And we also know that, hey, you know, we're going to be in there and we're going to put up more buildings, we're going to do more stuff, we're going to do more training in that area, and we're going to have a significant impact on that something that we have to consider and, and be uh, aware of. You know, I, I usually have an interpreter. I've got a regional dialectical speech impediment, otherwise known as a southern drawl, but I hope I've got through to you. Appreciate it, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks, General. 
Um, next, we're going to have uh, Admiral Phillips. Thank you, John. Good morning, everyone. Let me make sure I have this position so that you can hear me, but I'm not going to punch myself in the nose with it. That might be uh, less than entertaining. Um, maybe more so for you and less so for me. So uh, as John said, I'm the Special Assistant to the Governor of Virginia for Coastal Adaptation and Protection. Uh, I come to this position by way of 31 years as a surface warfare officer, and after retiring uh, and staying in the Hampton Roads region in Norfolk where I live, uh, having an opportunity to be a part of an intergovernmental pilot project that took place in that region from 2014 to 2016. I led the infrastructure working group. Uh, I found the issue compelling. I was honored and, and frankly fortunate to have 25 regional uh, state and federal professionals in my infrastructure working group who were passionate about the issue of rising waters, sea level rise, and flooding impact on the Hampton Roads region. And uh, they educated me on the need. And, uh, and when we finished, um, not a lot happened. Uh, that made me angry because there was such a crushing uh, obligation to move forward. I found my way to the Center for, si for Climate and Security, and, um, and things have carried on from there. So that is, that's my story, and I've been asked to talk a little bit today about the pilot project, a little bit about what's going on on the ground in the state of Virginia, um, and the challenges that that then leads to in the context of national security and the impact of climate on national security. So in Virginia, uh, we've experienced 18 inches of relative sea level rise as judged by the Sewell's Point tide gauge over the last 100 years, roughly. And we expect that we will see nearly that much again by 2050. So there's a rapid acceleration in place. Virginia has one of the highest rates of acceleration uh, on the East Coast. We also have a subsidence challenge, particularly in the Hampton Roads region. It's not universal across the region. It's, it's much more of the problem in some places, much less in others. But uh, that is an added part of our challenge, and that makes our solution set different than it might be in other locations. Um, what we are experiencing in Virginia now across coastal Virginia is, is not just uh, the need to prepare. We are already living with water. Uh, in some cases, at least on a weekly or even maybe monthly basis, but more recently this fall, and, and we are seeing a trend. General Castellall described a trend. We are also seeing a trend in coastal Virginia where the incidence of recurrent flooding are more frequent. It stays around longer. It's higher and more things can cause it. Of course, all of this is related to the fact that we have 18 extra inches of water already. And so tide, wind, rain, or any combination of the above creates a scenario where we have water where we don't want it and we don't need it, and it impacts our ability to go about our daily lives. And so what does that mean in the context of what's in coastal Virginia? First of all, Virginia is the state with the highest percentage of its gross domestic product derived from our federal presence, almost 9%, 8.9%. That's 2017 data from Office of Economic Adjustment. We are also highest in defense personnel spending and second highest in defense contract spending and defense-related contract spending. So we are wedded to the federal government, whether we like it or not. We also have a substantial port, the Port of Virginia. Uh, depending on how you're measuring it, it's the fourth largest container port by volume, or the fifth by this, or the sixth by that. But the point is it's large, it's growing, it's located in and around the Hampton Roads region. There are four separate facilities in Hampton Roads and three others around the state of Virginia. And it is vulnerable. It is at risk. It takes the issue seriously and has done quite a bit to prepare, but this is also a part of our military and logistics supply chain. It's one of 17 critical infrastructure ports. It's not a critical military infrastructure port, but it's a critical infrastructure port in the United States. So what comes in and out of that port goes all the way, is taken as it comes in past the Mississippi River, so that's where our influence is, and those things include commodities by and large. Export, we're the largest coal export point on the east coast of the United States. You can love coal or you can hate coal, but it's going out through Virginia. And we export agricultural products and large, large percentage of agricultural products come in and out through the state of Virginia. So. We also have a huge tourism industry and economy, an aquaculture and fisheries economy, and of course, the ever-present waterfront property, uh, which generates tax revenue for our localities. And who lives in those localities? Soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, civilian employees of the federal 
uh, entities that are there, contractors that support the federal entities that are there. 60% of the people in the Hampton Roads region alone live in one city and work in another. So you can't just protect one piece of the region, one base, one piece of the port. Everything is interconnected. It's an interconnected system of systems, and its future is vitally dependent on the ability of all of those pieces to work together to move forward, which drives the larger need for a climate security plan for a full federal strategy and process, and particularly in the context of the impact on national security. What the pilot project came up with as outcomes across the whole of government and community for Hampton Roads were five key points. The first is set standards, collective standards that apply to regions that everyone understands. The second is ensure the support of a consortium of universities in whatever context that applies so that you have the best possible science and engineering uh, data and updated data over time. The third is to be able to collaborate that data, collect it, and share it, and disseminate it in a way that is usable by any party that might need access to it. Fourth, identify what infrastructure is critical and vulnerable. And I don't mean just the Department of Homeland Security definition of critical and vulnerable. I mean, what is the essence of the place? What has to be there for it to be what it is? And what does not have to be there? And then make your decisions about what your priorities are and how you're going to approach them. This is a big part of my job now in the state of Virginia. And I can tell you it is a, a significant challenge in a Dillon rule state that has pushed planning to the regional and local level. Fascinating challenge, a little bit out of the realm of national security, but it'll have an impact because that applies how Virginia views itself and how it wants to use and employ its coast for its future over time. This is a critical decision and these are critical factors for us. And of course, the last piece is how will we pay for this? What are the funding structures and strategies and instruments that will be required to support this need? A huge need for the Defense Department but really for all federal agencies and entities and for the states and for the localities that will have to deal with this. So there has been a PhD paper put out on this issue uh, very recently done by Dr. Hannah Teacher. She studied the Hampton Roads pilot project and she also studied the San Diego region and the recent memorandum of understanding between the port of San Diego and Command Navy region Southwest and looked at those two shared efforts and came up with a couple of key points which I'd like to just bring up here, namely that the shared risk between installations and communities bring a great potential for joint planning and drive a need for it. And also that one of the two most critical points that Dr. Teacher identifies is recognizing independence and constructing credibility as the key to initiating and reinforcing alliances between federal partners and local communities. And those partnerships are what's going to be able to give us the opportunity to move forward. There are other programs that are up of great value in this context. The Office of Economic Adjustment Joint Land Use Studies uh, are, are significant, um, positive. We've had significant positive incomes, out, outcomes from them in the state of Virginia. Uh, understanding that what impacts the, the community and how that impacts the base and federal facilities, and also working with the Army Corps on coastal storm risk management studies. But. The key to remember there is coastal storm risk management studies are focused on coastal storm risk. They are not focused on sea level rise. They are not focused on recurrent flooding. And so the outcomes that they uh, recommend may be of great value in preventing storm surge, but they may not do anything for the recurrent routine flooding that we are starting to see in Hampton Roads. So recent NOAA data just put out this year, 2019, shows that by the mid-2020s in Hampton Roads, nearly every high tide, at least half of them every year, um, nearly half every year, will approach the nuisance flood level. So that means we're going to see flooding on roads that people use to get to work every day that get into Naval Station North at Hampton Boulevard, one of our key uh, friction points. Shore Drive, another key friction point because it acts as Joint Base, Little Creek, Fort Story. Um, areas where we're seeing flooding now, we're going to see flooding a whole lot more often. And that will negatively impact our ability to execute our mission uh, in the context of environmental readiness, degrading environmental challenges, degrading readiness over time. So this is our challenge in coastal Virginia. And it's not just Hampton Roads, uh, Wallops Island, huge NASA facility in Wallops, Navy's a tenant command there, but Navy does an awful lot of missile testing there. It's our only missile test range on the East Coast. It, we do an awful lot of radar testing and training. It's all out on Wallops Island, which is all in a special flood hazard area. So a very vulnerable facility, critical to national infrastructure and our ability to 
train and prepare our forces to operate downrange and test our new weapon systems and radars, but uh, equally very, very vulnerable facility. That's Wallops Island, Dahlgren, AP Hill, up here in, in Northern Virginia, number of facilities at the federal level, absolutely critical and certainly vulnerable. So uh, in the context of what's on the ground, what we are seeing in, in coastal Virginia, um, this is a today problem. This is impacting and chipping away at our forces and our readiness and our ability to project power downrange now. It's not just a Navy problem, as you heard earlier from previous speakers. It's also an Air Force problem. Langley, Eustis, average elevation eight feet above sea level. That means a lot of it's below eight feet of elevation. Um, Fort Eustis, where our Army keeps all of its boats, very low area, very vulnerable, uh, and all of this critical infrastructure um, is at risk. So uh, I, I attempt to make a compelling case for you for the need to take action now. It's very easy to say, sun shining, wind's not blowing, don't have a high tide, everything's fine, but um, spend some time in coastal Virginia and, and you, will, you too will have a water story, you will view this differently. And if you, you don't have to spend much time in the Hampton Roads region to understand the essential impact and the criticality of uh, our challenge and its impact on our ability to e execute our national security strategy. Thank we you. have no time to waste. Um, one of my favorite sayings, time and tide wait for no man. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral. <laughs> General Galloway. Uh, thank you very much. Let me start with two quotes. Uh, or paraphrases. The first comes from the Army Field Manual 101-5, which was put out in 1980. It's been revised. Um, weather and terrain have more of an impact on military operations than any other factors. Weather and terrain. The second is from an equally uh, good source, and I'll see how many of you know where it came from. Toto, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. <laughs> we're in a different world than we were. Uh, in 1980, we could see some uh, ideas that there might be climate change. I've worked in the, the Mississippi Basin for almost half my life, and I've seen the challenges with what's going on with floods in that area. We've noticed uh, since really the 70s and 80s, we were losing Louisiana. If those of you who have been down there, the coast of Louisiana is disappearing. The second most vulnerable area is coastal Maryland, the eastern shore of Maryland. Uh, I invite... Uh, uh, you, when you go to Virginia, a beautiful place, I live in Virginia, and you go north on the Del Mar Peninsula, you'll see the challenges we both face. We face with Annapolis uh, uh, for the Navy and the Naval Academy. We face with other installations that are in this particular region. So we know that weather and terrain have an impact. You can think of that in terms of Napoleon trying to get to uh, uh, Moscow, Hitler trying to attack Moscow, all the things you've seen in pictures. Or you can think of things you've seen more recently, like the pictures of Offutt Air Force Base underwater. Uh, but then you can think of things are changing, and they're changing rapidly. And we can see that. We are on the east coast of the U.S. having sea level rise at a much faster rate than other places in the world. And so it's important that we know and understand that. Well, military bases at home and abroad are terribly important. I spent 38 years as an Army engineer, combat and then civil works engineer, worrying about things like floods. And then 23 years since then, I've been engaged in trying to deal with how we deal with these disasters, with floods being the principal one. And they're all around us, and they're hitting us every day. Uh, now, you can say military bases at home, uh, that, that's important, but we ought to be able to take care of that. No, no. What are the military bases? There are launch platforms. There are how we get troops ready to go overseas. You've heard uh, General Keyes mention that we need to deploy. You can't deploy unless you have a base from which to deploy. There are the uh, uh, logistics centers for the supplies we need, the high quality uh, equipment that we use, the people that are repairing it and using that. There are the places where we do our training. And uh, Joan will give you a lot about the training and why it is so difficult and the challenges we're facing on bases across the country uh, in trying to keep up with what the weather is doing to us. Uh, they're also operational. Many of you have seen movies, if not other things, where you see somebody sitting in Nevada operating a drone that's flying somewhere else in the world. So we have tactical operations being conducted from bases in the United States. So we need to have them ready to go, able to participate in whatever the operations are. 
and they have a, a defined area in all of these bases, and you say, well, that's okay, Fort Benning is here, or Fort Bragg, but to get to the right airfield or get to the port, you have to go, as, as Admiral Phillips has mentioned, you have to go cross country, you have to go through communities, you have to find roads that work, and you have to have the support that you need uh, to, to be able to power the, the bases themselves and have the people there, they have to be able to get to the base and the people that live on base uh, uh, have to be able to have the support from the lifelines that we all know. It may be water, it may be power. Uh, we've got to think these things through as a team, we need to address them and they're not getting better. And that's why we're not in Kansas anymore. Uh, we did a sea level study, the Center for Climate and Security, uh, of bases on the east shore, east coast and the Gulf Coast. And we looked at what was happening. And you could see the pictures of what would be happening in, in 2050, 2070. And these are estimates. We really don't know. Uh, we, I'm on the Coast Smart Council of the state of Maryland. We just came up with a, an approximation of where we'd be in the years ahead in sea level rise. It isn't a pretty picture. It isn't a pretty picture if you take the bad situation even with a moderate situation, it's very difficult for us. And what should you be doing if you're preparing or thinking about this? Uh, you may recall after 9-11, what we had was a, a committee that looked at what did we miss? And the answer was a failure of imagination. And so in this report that the center put out for the military on these bases, they said, think the tragedy, think the catastrophe. You don't have to bill for it but you better have thought through what you would do. Again, uh, General Keyes brought out the issue of you've got to be prepared for the completely unknown and you've got to think of what you do. We now say in the United States flood community, there's no such thing as absolute protection. We cannot guarantee you protection in, in Houston or in New Orleans or at Offutt Air Force Base because nature is going to do something different. We thought we could run 60,000 models and tell us what could happen, what where it possibly might have another hurricane come in. But nature doesn't read that same model the same way. And so it may come up with a different way. Had uh, Hurricane Harvey come in at a slightly different angle, the damage would have been far in excess of what you see uh, we're still trying to cope with. So there's a lot of things going on and we've got to be prepared to think about it. And we need our best talent on it. We need to identify the risk at every military installation in this country and we need to identify what we're gonna do about that and start being funded, if we're not already, and in many places they are, to how to deal with them, and then be prepared to implement them in a, uh, these preparations, implement them in a phase basis. We cannot afford uh, to do everything right up at the start, but we can afford to get started, and we can see how things change over time. And so that becomes terribly uh, important to everybody, that we recognize it's a problem. But who else are we thinking about? We're thinking about those bases overseas where we have our own troops and the bases where our allies and partners work. We need to help them understand where we know and where we've got the scientific community behind us what's going to happen under these climate change conditions. Diego Garcia, uh, sitting in the middle of the Indian Ocean or out at the edge of the Indian Ocean, is a supply base. That's where we keep a lot of supplies. Uh, we need to have that ready to be used. We have allies that help us in lots of different places, and you mentioned the Straits of Malacca. I've been working in Singapore. Uh, they have a small problem. They're an island, and if sea level rises, where do they go? And so they are planning now for 50 years ahead. They are building now for 20 years ahead. They're doing things that mean we can work with them and we can see a future with them. So we've got to be dealing with home and abroad what's happening. We mentioned earlier that uh, the problems you have uh, outside of the bases is the communities that are there. Uh, it's what the failure to do, deal with those places overseas can cause. It can cause turmoil if there is a flood or a natural disaster that causes these communities not to be able to operate. The people aren't getting supported and you see uh, unrest in the countries. And that can be a flash for so many different things. Um, we're dealing with some tough issues. Sea level rise, we know that. Uh, floods, we don't really understand what's happening to floods. There's a lot of floods going on. Uh, there's something that you all have seen in Washington, D.C., uh, cloudburst. Uh, we've discovered that these things come in like a punch and they dump a tremendous amount of water in a, a relatively narrow area. Should we have a Category 4 storm in this region uh, and go over Washington, D.C., 
it's expected you could have as much as 12 feet of water on Constitution Avenue. In 2006, from a rainfall event on a Saturday night, we had three feet of water on Constitution Avenue, and we put down uh, the IRS for six months. Now, maybe that's a good thing, but in any case, uh, there was water inside the new National Archives uh, Auditorium. There were things that were happening here to say, this is the hub, this is the operational center for the Pentagon, for everybody else, what would happen under these circumstances? We've got to be prepared for that. At Fort Hood, we had nine soldiers killed when a flash flood occurred, and we didn't have enough advance warning for them to know how to get out of the way and what to do. Uh, wildfires have, have been a real problem, and they're growing. Temperature is causing not only it to be difficult for the soldier or the sailor himself or herself, uh, it, is a, it is a problem for us overall in how we treat the facilities and how our equipment is going to operate. You all may recall a couple of years ago at uh, Sky Harbor in Phoenix, they didn't let Delta planes take off certain class because it was too hot, they couldn't lift off. Well, I, I'm going to war, excuse me, you can't go. Well, that's what we've got to be prepared for. We've got to be able to deal with the new conditions, what they mean to us in terms of altitude, heat, all the factors that need to be taken into account, or the choppy Pacific that we went across in World War II and may have to go back to in our Pacific-oriented opportunities. So all of these things affect the battlefield. They affect how we fight. It, will the battlefield be different? You bet it will be. Uh, will our equipment be able to be useful, it's got to be modified, we know that. So in climate change, we recognize that we've got to take care of our bases, we've got to take care of our soldiers, sailors, and airmen, we've got to take care of the, our allies and get them uh, working. And equally important, we need to be hand in glove with our counterparts in our civilian communities and the people who are in technology that are doing so much for us to be ready for the 21st century. And I'll stop there. Thanks, General. Joan? Thank you very much. And General, when I was coming up from Richmond this morning on the train, I was thinking about Toto as well. <laughs> really, we are not in Kansas anymore. But it's really a pleasure to be here today, and in particular to talk about the issue. You know, sometimes people ask me, well, what keeps you up at night? besides pizza and a beer at 11.30. Um, well, it really is the risk of climate change and how it impacts training readiness. Um, because training impacts, it actually runs in my blood because that is what I focused on for the last 20 years of my career. So this is an important issue to me even now. So from my perspective, climate change is no doubt a game changer when it comes to having a fully prepared force because readiness depends on the ability of DOD to rapidly respond to unpredictable global threats. Training of the force is critical to that readiness and the cornerstone to training are the ranges that include the air, sea space, and training lands that support it. Well, why is that important? Because to decisively win and survive on the battlefield depends upon realistic training and being able to replicate the operational environment. Now, I'm gonna step you through the reasons why the climate change is a game changer to training readiness. So when we talk about ranges and the range enterprise as a whole, I want to let you know that each of the services currently faces shortfall and challenges with regard to range capability. As an example, some of the services have shortfalls in automated ranges, feeding and scoreback mechanism, spectrum issues, airspace limitations and deficiencies in maneuver land, as well as personnel, range personnel as well, all of which are needed to support the doctrinal requirements. Those challenges that they face in range capability are also compounded by 
compliance with environmental regulations and also challenges dealing with urban straw and energy as well. So the bottom line is this. The services are challenged by existing shortfalls in range capability that are further compounded by encroachment impacts. And this is not something new to Congress. This is something that has been reported to Congress multiple years since 2001. Now, let's throw climate change into the mix. And when we do that, we just change the risk level to training readiness because climate change factors such as sea level rise, frequent and more intense weather events, the droughts, the rising temperatures, and the wildfires are impacting our range enterprise. They're also impacting the carrying capacity of the land to support that training. That is the natural infrastructure. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a couple of examples, and believe me, the list can go on for a long time. But we have all heard about Offutt today, um, Air Force Base in Nebraska, with seven feet of water inundated, causing $650 million in damages. In 2018, Hurricane Michael flattened Tyndall Air Force Base, causing $4.7 billion in damages. That same year, Hurricane Florence came rolling up the coast, battering Camp Lejeune, causing $3.6 billion in damages from massive flooding and beach erosion, making it harder to train and certify units for overseas deployments. It also hit Bragg, causing damages up to $55 million. And of course, this year, Hurricane Dorian came up the coast again. A lot of the installations were spared, but some still had damages. In the spring of 2017, snow melt in excess of 200% of annual average resulted in heavy spring flooding at Fallon Naval Air Station in Nevada. This significantly impacted the B-16 and B-20 bombing ranges, the roads, the target tree, and canceled training. Damages were estimated at $650 million. And in a six month period between 2015 and 2016, intensive rainfall events hit Benning, Jackson, and Polk, causing severe flooding, washing out target tree, roads, and damaging a multi-million dollar digital range complex. Impacts to training, to say the least, were significant. Total damages at those three installations were estimated at $23.5 million. In Alaska, rising temperatures have increased snow melt, that resulted in heavy flooding. It damaged extensively the battle area complex at Donnelly Training Area and resulted also in maneuver training areas that weren't usable for months. Thawing permafrost has resulted in loss of access to training areas. And also it has reduced the number of months that land can be used, maneuver land can be used to support heavy maneuver training. So then we have wildfires. Wildfires in the West have, and in Alaska as well, have resulted in loss of training days, restrictions to live fire training, as well as aviation. Sea level rise has also in recent years taken its toll on Camp Pendleton, which has seen a documented progressive loss of the beach impacting their amphibious training exercises. You know, the repair of ranges and training lands doesn't happen overnight. And when exercises and events are delayed or canceled, there's a cascading impact as the services struggle to find acceptable solutions. Sometimes those solutions are workarounds and not all workarounds are acceptable. So these are just a few examples and I could go on. And some of them, you know, 
haven't reached CNN or ABC News, but those impacts are out there, and they're impacting training now. We don't have to sit here and say, what if? It is now. So business has changed. It is not the same. And as a former program manager for 7 million acres of maneuver training land for the Army, I can tell you I have never seen such devastation as I have in the last seven years. It is, to me, staggering. So these are just a few examples. It's impacting our ability to train and to support our training requirements. The trend line is shifting with an environment that is more conducive to wildfires, droughts, followed by intensive rain that causes temporary and prolonged loss of available training land. Erosion will get worse. Let's face it, heavy maneuver training is inherently damaging to the land. You couple that with intense storms and you're gonna get more erosion and loss of land for training. That is going to impact readiness. So what I can tell you is this. Climate change is now part of the equation. It is part of the equation when we look at the services range capability, both in terms of their infrastructure, their personnel, their training lands, their airspace, and how we can train to doctrinal standard. Climate change multiplies the risk of compromising training readiness. So what can we do? Well, the plan that we have that they're going to speak about in the next panel lays out some good things. But I can tell you, we not only need to understand the full risk and vulnerabilities, but also to our range enterprise, but also to the natural infrastructure and how the land is going to respond to climate change conditions now and over time. So we don't have the luxury to wait, so action is required now. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. So, so thanks. Um, we have time for a, a couple of questions here. Uh, I don't know who's got the microphone. There it is over there. Um, but keep in mind, as you listen to all this stuff today, let me, let me iterate two points. One, this is a today problem, and it's getting worse. So tomorrow's problem is going to be worse than today's problem. But for today, it's, an, it's, a, it's, an, it's a today issue at Tyndall. It's a today issue at Offutt. It's a today issue at Lejeune. It's a today issue at all those training bases. It's a today issue at Hampton Roads. Things are happening now, and they're going to get worse. The military is a mission-focused organization. They want to do their job. That's why we're talking about this here and now, and that's why it's a national security issue here and now. But it's happening to all the other communities, too. It's happening outside our bases, too. And so there are impacts well beyond what we're talking about today. But from the national security perspective, um, to, to have that square in your, in your mind. And we can give other examples if we need to. So let's do the questions. Thank you. David Clark, Citizens Climate Lobby. For any and all of you, what do you say to those individuals, including individual one, who deny that climate change is happening? What do you say to those individuals who deny that climate change is happening? All right, I'm going to I'm going to take that one because I, I I have a concise answer. And the fact of the matter is is that a non-scientist talking to a non-scientist about a scientific issue is rarely going to yield some sort of great revelation that counters 98 percent of the science community. So we can just move past that. I think is the is the answer to the question because this isn't a science debate anymore, and non-scientists debating it is not particularly helpful. We see these issues going on today. Thank you. From Congressman Jared Huffman's office, 
In comparison to other powers like China and Russia, is the United States military uniquely vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, whether due to its particular geography, a basing strategy location, or other factors? That's a great question. Who wants to take it? I don't think that uh, we're unique. They, I've been to China, I've been to other places in Southeast Asia, into Europe. They're all working on the same issues. Uh, and in some cases, they're working harder. Uh, the Chinese are trying to uh, uh, come up with ways to deal with climate change. They're trying to come up with ways to adapt to the, the uh, same problems they have of sea level rise and coastal surges. Uh, they're, they're seeing massive uh, dam failures, uh, problems with flooding, and they're trying to deal with that. Uh, I think we all are sharing ideas on what can be done. And the biggest part of that is to involve the local communities at the local level in trying to deal with it because they're happening so many places so frequently that the central government can't solve it all by themselves. I think we're working on that, and I think that our, our allies and our potential adversaries are also. Nature is being non-discriminatory in how it's applying its force. Anybody else want to take a whack at it, or, or is that good? Okay, it sounds like that's good. Next, got questions in the back here. Mark Kodak, I'm a retired uh, Army Headquarters civilian. How can uh, DOD use the existing regional partnerships to actually get the message across that uh, climate and security should be part of the discussion within those partnerships. So, so the question is, how how can we use how can DoD use regional partnerships to uh, to make more progress on the climate issues? I think I'll I'll jump in on that one since there's quite a bit of that going on in uh, in coastal Virginia now, particularly in Hampton Road. So there are a couple of great examples. One is um, related to Chesapeake Bay and water quality management. So Commander Navy Region Mid Atlantic is the executive agent for all Chesapeake Bay water quality compliance um, act, act issues. Um, they uh, have recently hosted, and it's, this is done every couple of years, not every year, a, com a full commander's conference with every base commander that is in a Chesapeake Bay watershed present uh, and talking, talking about the need to you know, not only comply but to come up with creative and uh, combined kinds of solutions in the context of we're already uh, taking advantage of the funding that they have to make that funding also apply not only with water quality but also now to try to enhance water management and deal with uh, excessive flooding, recurrent flooding and other kinds of challenges. So. In the context of thinking about a program that's already in existence, um, we've seen actually a lot of excellent activity in this regard, and it's a way to talk about a problem without directly tying it to something that's at conflict with the administration. So in addition to that, uh, I think what we're seeing at, at least at a regional level is more and more interest in the facilities, in the context of environmental resilience and building environmental resilience, of the facilities working with their community partners to try to ensure not only they have base-wide resilience, but that that base-wide resilience includes uh, thinking about the challenges that the environment is creating for that circumstance. So in Hampton Roads is one example. The city of Hampton is working with Joint Base Lang Langley Eustis, particularly the Langley side, which is what's in uh, the confines of their city boundaries, to help the base prepare for the circumstance where it might need to move its runway inland some to prevent flooding that now impacts the runway. So the city and the base have been collaborating on this effort for years. They have finished a joint land use study. There are a number of actions in that joint land use study that the city and the base have agreed they think is important and they are starting to take action on some of those particular um, outcomes. Planning to relocate gates as one example. And, and so this is a tremendous example of a community partnership with a federal facility where they're thinking together and they've been working together because they built up this timeline of a long-standing partnership. Similar circumstances with Newport News and, and Fort Eustis. We're starting to see more and more of this type of collaboration in the southern south side of Hampton Roads, which is Chesapeake, Norfolk, Virginia Beach. Uh, also, I would say another shout out to the joint land use study process, 
caused by and facilitated by joint land use studies because you've got the military and the communities in the room together with stakeholders, with utilities, with other infrastructure providers and stakeholders in the region, and they're all talking about what their challenges are, and they're getting a much better opportunity for a shared understanding of what the problems are, how to prioritize those problems, and to start to seek solutions. So, of course, the biggest issue is going to be funding. How do we get funding to plan? And then how, once we have that plan in place, how do we build over time? But the opportunity for creative outcomes really gets back to some of Dr. Teacher's work is if you have an ability to seek solutions within the context of where you are uh, and you have a common goal, then you're able to move forward and make progress. And we're, we're starting to see that. I think I'm heartened to see that uh, starting to take place in coastal Virginia. Let me make example. a quick hit on uh, follow up on that. Uh, I think another good example is Tyndall. Uh, Tyndall is holding a series of uh, meetings with the local community. Uh, and what the goal is is not to restore Tyndall to its former glory, but to build it like it should be, considering all of the environmental concerns that we have now. And uh, they're bringing in all the community elements, the regional elements to do that. And I will say one thing about the climate lobby, keep doing what you're doing. You guys are having an impact, so keep at it. All right, I think we have time for one more question. So uh, with the microphone back there, you're going to have to pick and pick who your best friend is and who's not going to, who's going to resent you afterwards. Hi, could you shed some light on some of the geopolitical concerns with Arctic ice melt? Geopolitical with Arctic ice melt. Anybody want to talk about great power competition in the Arctic? Um, I, I, I think some of that's going to get hit in the next panel, but let me do a let me do a 30 second uh, blip. You know, when you have a national defense strategy put out by this administration that talks about great power competition, uh, I think nowhere is that seen more directly uh, and and climate change seen more directly than in the in the Arctic and where you've got uh, Russia and China looking to compete for resources. So we're going to have some conversation about about that, but it is. Um, more than just the Arctic, where you're going to see these dynamics around the world, and I think we'll have some of that discussion in the next panel as well. But, but thanks for putting it all in our minds and bubbling as, as, we, as we go forward. And I think now uh, I've, I've hit my timer, so, so we're going to... You want to do one more question? We're going to do one more question, because I've been told to do one more question. You get to make one more friend back there, um, and, and, we'll, and then we'll wrap up, and we'll switch panels. My name is Wayne Edmondson. I'm from Congressman Jerry Connolly's office. The question I have is about global health security. Um, with, flood, with more flooding that comes along with climate change, there's going to be more freestanding water. Diarrheal disease, malaria are two of the biggest killers in the world. And it also is, affects our national security. It, we diverge resources to support those type of missions. Um, can you shed any light on insight, maybe that looking into how you know, climate change is also going to affect global health security? As, as an engineer, let me say that that's a problem that we all grasp. Uh, look at New Orleans and what happened when the city was underwater. But look at Bangladesh, where you're dealing with uh, 50,000 people killed in a big uh, hurricane, and they have, or a cyclone, and you have these, these challenges. Everyone around the world recognizes that as you have these more intense and longer uh, lasting on the ground flooding events where you weren't able to contain them, that you're going to have to deal with that. The World Health Organization, every water organization I know is trying to work out a solution. But each one is individual. And that's where the cooperative efforts of our uh, United Nations and others really make a difference. We have a World Water Assessment Program, uh, UN in Perugia, Italy. They are with the people in the World Health Organization. They're working to see how you share ideas and to try and address it. It's not something that's done overnight. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for your questions. Thank you to the panelists. Can we have one more round of applause? I, I, th I think that as the second panel comes up, we're going to have uh, Caitlin, you're going to talk about the fellows program. And, all right. All right. Thank you, guys. We're going to start off on a uh, our second panel of the day. So thank you for spending your morning with us to talk about climate change and, and national security. 
Uh, this panel is going to discuss the release of the latest report by the Climate and Security Advisory Group, uh, a climate security plan for America. Um, but in addition to this report, I'd also like to draw your attention to another report that was released today by the Climate and Security Advisory Group's Fellowship Program. Uh, this is a group of distinguished uh, up and coming climate and security professionals that have met uh, once a month uh, for the last year to, to talk about climate and security. And this uh, report, you can find it at the climateandsecurity.org forward slash CSAG fellowship. Um, the CSAG fellowship program is also currently accepting applications for its second class. It's a very much a, a community wide collaborative fellowship program. The Center for Climate Security works in partnership with the American Security Project and Woodrow Wilson's Environmental Change and Security Program to host uh, this program. And we're very excited about it. And it's managed by Esther Babson, who just does amazing work. So if you or anyone you know is interested in um, applying to the, the next year of the fellowship program, please be sure to check out the report and the application online. That's climateandsecurity.org forward slash CSAG fellowship. I see some of the fellows here, too, by the yeah, way. Yeah, so if you want to, yeah. You can't hide. <laughs> okay. Great. Um, and now I'd like to turn the panel over to Francesco Femia, uh, who's moderating the second panel, which, again, is focused on the Climate and Security Plan for America. Francesco Femia is the CEO of the Council on Strategic Risks. He's the co-founder of the Center for Climate and Security. He's the manager and senior advisor of the International Military Council on Climate Security. At CSR, he oversees uh, all the programs, including the Center for Climate Security's work, the Converging Risk Labs, and the Council, uh, the Center on Strategic Risks. Um, he's published extensively on the security implications of climate change and natural disaster in uh, water, uh, resource mismanagement in Syria and North Africa, including the report, the seminal report 2012 on um, the Arab Spring and climate change. He's a frequent commentator on how the defense and national security intelligence communities are managing the security implications of, of climate change. So without further ado, I'll let you take the floor away. Thanks very much, Caitlin. Um, I will say, full disclosure, Caitlin and I are married, so she's, she's, she's a little bit biased. So I don't know, biased positively or negatively, I don't know, but, um, but I, I appreciate that. Um, so uh, first of all, thanks to everyone, and thanks to our distinguished panel. I was just telling Admiral McGinn that who is, who is saying, you know, this is a well-organized event, that it would really not be any kind of event at all without, without them. And so we're really honored to have uh, uh, this panel with us and the previous panel with us. Uh, they've all been incredibly um, uh, helpful in really developing a set of recommendations that we have in this climate security plan today. The Climate Security Plan for America um, essentially calls on the U.S. President to recognize climate change as a vital national security threat. Uh, and that, that, ch that word wasn't chosen lightly. Uh, and to lead by issuing a national strategy um, uh, to fulfill what we call a responsibility to prepare for and prevent that threat. And that means both preparing for those risks that are already baked into the system based on the climatic changes that we will see no matter what we do at this point, but also preventing uh, some of the more catastrophic consequences that we could see, uh, you know, out into the future. And so, uh, which really involves reducing the scale and the scope of climate change uh, by reducing emissions. So both of those things are critical to this plan. The top recommendation is that the President issue a national strategy directive, which would be sort of a new type of directive, uh, creating a climate security plan for America and to establish a White House office on climate security uh, led by a senior uh, official reporting directly to the President to implement a major government-wide effort to address the issue in all its security dimensions. Uh, of course, this, this plan is aimed at the President of the United States, it could be this President, could be the next president, um, but I think what we uh, make clear in this report is that uh, this this has to happen very soon uh, if we're a, if we're going to stave off some of the worst security consequences that uh, that that we might see. Um, the plan is endorsed by an extraordinary group of 64 senior military, national security, and intelligence leaders, including eight retired four-star generals and admirals, 30 senior military officers retired, a former NASA administrator a past chair of the National Intelligence Council, the former climate lead at the National Intelligence Council, who's, who's, who's here to my left, and a number of former assistant secretaries and deputy undersecretaries of defense, um, three of whom are on this, uh, on this panel and many others. Um, so I, talk, I, I mentioned that um, uh, essentially to, to say that you know, there, there are a lot of 
recommendations out there for how we deal with the climate crisis. A lot of them have a lot of merit. Uh, here's a plan uh, that is being proposed by a set of very serious, clear-eyed national security professionals about what we should do. And the plan is quite ambitious and quite bold, and we think it needs to happen uh, soon. Uh, it rec the plan recommends four pillars of action. General Keyes mentioned uh, these pillars earlier today. Um, those are demonstrate leadership, number one, assess climate risks, number two, support our allies and our partners uh, in, in dealing with climate risk and also in dealing with a transition uh, to, to a clean energy economy, and also preparing for and preventing climate impacts, which is, a, as, as John mentioned earlier, uh, is a really big part, of, and as General Keyes mentioned earlier, is a really big part of this. Each of our panelists will be addressing one of these categories in particular, though you should feel free to stray into you know, other issues if you'd like. Um, and, and I'm going to introduce them now, um, you know, per these sort of sections. Uh, talking about leadership, I think, is someone who has a lot of experience as a leader in a number of areas, both in the military and also outside, uh, you know, as former leader of, of ACOR, the American Council on Renewable Energy, and that's Vice Admiral Dennis McGinn. Uh, Danny McGinn is the, the, a member of the Center for Climate Security Advisory Board. He's previously served as Assistant Secretary of the, uh, Secretary of the Navy for Energy, Installations, and Environment. In that role, he led the transformation of naval installations towards greater mission resiliency through energy efficiency, renewable energy, microgrids, uh, and other technologies. Um, so we're going to be we're going to start with Admiral McGinn. Why don't I'll introduce everybody, and then we'll and then we'll get started. Um, talking about assessing climate risks is someone who's been doing a lot of assessing uh, in in his career, and that's uh, and that's Rod Schoonover. Um, Rod Schoonover is owner of the Ecological Futures Group. Uh, from 2009 to 2019, um, he was a senior analyst in the Bureau of Intelligence and Research at the Department of State. Before that, he served as Director of Health, Environment, and Natural Resources at the National Intelligence Council. Um, talking about supporting allies and partners, we have the Honorable Sherry Goodman. Sherry Goodman is Senior Strategist at the Center for Climate and Security. She's Chair of the Board of the Council on Strategic Risk, so really, honestly, she's our boss. Um, she's Secretary General of the International Military Council on Climate Security, which she co-chairs with General Tom Middendorp, the former Chief of Defense of the Netherlands. She previously was General Counsel and Corporate Secretary of CNA, where she was recognized for her leadership in creating and leading the CNA Military Advisory Board. Sherry also served as the first Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Environmental Security. Lastly, uh, but certainly not least, we have uh, the Honorable John Conger, who's going to be talking about the broad suite of issues related to preparing for and preventing climate impacts. John is the director of the Center for Climate Security, the chair of the Center for, uh, for the uh, Climate and Security Advisory Group. He previously served as the principal deputy undersecretary of defense comptroller at the U.S. Department of Defense, where he oversaw billions of U.S. dollars, and we like to joke that he oversaw you know, a few more dollars there than he is now as director of the Center for, Center for Climate Security, just a few. Um, and uh, he was also the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Energy Installations and Environment, who's basically leading the DOD's approach to climate change. Uh, so that's our panel. Uh, they're a great group of people. We're going to start with Admiral McGinn, who's going to talk about leadership. I'd ask uh, that we elevate our thoughts to 50,000 feet uh, or more and really look at this in the broadest possible context. We're, we're all concerned with uh, all of the aspects of climate change, uh, resilience, mitigation, et cetera. But I want to start by saying this. This is not fake news. Any good journalist asks the journalist questions, who, what, when, where, how, and why. So the who, Frank pointed out, are a group of experts in national security, military and civilian, intelligence and military operations, that know the national security structure, know the problems, know the challenges here and abroad, the who is about as credible as you get. The what is the plan to talk about climate change? The where? Everywhere. We talked on a previous panel about installations here in the United States, coastal areas, uh, wildfires in the West, but it extends also, as was also pointed out, across the globe. In terms of not just infrastructure threats and threats to, to uh, fragile governments and, and uh, societies, but threats to accelerate violence that the, our United States military, the young men and women in uniform, 
will be called upon to face now and in, in the future. The when is now. Pointed out by John Conger at the conclusion of the last panel, this is a today problem, and it doesn't get better without uh, us doing something about it. Let me talk about the why. If you look at the people who have been in the panels, the people who are on the uh, senior advisory group, others who aren't here, why are they doing it? It's not because they're getting big bucks from uh, oil companies or, or, or other uh, entities. They're doing it because they are patriots. They care about this country. They have given their lives dedicated to making this a truly beacon of hope for the whole world. And you, in order to be a beacon of hope, you have to exercise leadership. That is absolutely critical. I had the opportunity over uh, 35 years in uniform to be able to exercise some leadership. And I had the privilege of commanding many different uh, organizations in the United States Navy. Whenever I took command, I would gather my team around and say, I just want to let you know something about the way I think. I do a lot better job at solving problems that I know about. <laughs> and having talked to many plumbers over the years, real plumbers, that uh, leaks don't get better with age on their own. And if we think about climate change in that context, this is a real problem that we need to fix. Tom Friedman, great uh, former columnist for the New York Times and great author uh, about this subject, once said, remember, Mother Nature always bats last, and she always bats a thousand. Jerry Galloway pointed that out in his remarks earlier. So we've got to understand that this problem doesn't get better on its own. We have to acknowledge the problem in all of its dimensions, and we have to get on with doing something about it. Which brings us to the how. If you read this report, it is a detailed approach, a strategy, if you will, to getting after leadership by the United States and our allies in every aspect of our government, federal government, and to do specific things that will put us in a much better position to solve this problem, this biggest challenge of the 21st century, bar none. Bigger than North Korea, bigger than Iran, bigger than Russia, bigger than China, everywhere, all the time, for a long time. This is the greatest challenge of the 21st century. So a lot of folks, it came up earlier in one of the questions, what do you tell people that don't really uh, believe in climate change? Well, you tell them to get out of the way because we've got a problem to solve. You need, we need to understand that we are the ones that are going to be the, the, the solution providers and we need to have leadership. We need to get back into the Paris Accord. The United States leadership is essential. A lot of people who are deniers or skeptical about what we could or could not do about uh, climate change that are fearful that it's going to hurt our economy or our, our quality of life will say, yeah, but we can do everything right and we'll hurt our economy wrong. And oh, by the way, China and others are going to continue to, uh, to pollute uh, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. They will without leadership, without United States leadership. What's going on up in New York, the United Nations right now, requires United States leadership, not a choir of voices from many, many different parts of the world. Important as that may be, they need to have leadership. We can do it now, or we can do it in January of 2021. We need to get on with having some very real leadership. And I'll s conclude my remarks by uh, saying that climate change is the greatest challenge of the 21st century for our future national security, economic well-being, international order, and quality of life across the globe. It is essential that the United States step forward and lead by acting boldly now. We have the opportunity to transform this tremendous challenge into opportunities for technolo technological advancement, sustainable gro growth, 
and global coordin uh, coordination and cooperation. We are the people that are going to solve this. There's an old saying that we are the people we have been waiting for. We are. Nobody else is going to do it for us. We need to do it ourselves. And we need to get leadership across the federal government to match the leadership that we see in the private sector, leadership at the state level, to get on with doing something about this challenge. Thank you. Thanks very much, Evan. So I now want to turn to, to Rod Schoonover um, and, and, and just quickly to set it up. You know, the intelligence community of which Rod was a part for many years has been warning about climate change risks to security uh, for quite some time across both Republican and Democratic administrations. It's been in the worldwide threat assessment, assessment for the past 11 years, I believe. Uh, despite that, we've seen recently how, you know, sort of political uh, either pressure or a lack of interest can obscure such analysis and leave it sitting on the shelf. So how do we avoid that? How do we both ensure that such assessments continue and ensure that the U.S. government is using it and not ignoring it with shaping policy? So that's sort of a, a framing question. You can answer that or not. I will. Um, but but, uh, but that's, that's just the setup. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Um, thanks for having me today. Thanks for all of you for coming um, on what I think is one of the greatest challenges, if not the greatest challenge of the 21st century. Um, the job of the intelligence community is to provide, to assess risk and provide strategic warning to those risks. And those risks include climate change. And when the intelligence community looks at the, this issue broadly, uh, it, it looks at threats to the military and threats to militaries uh, uh, globally, also threats to other things that the United States depends on, for example, global food supplies or uh, the, the economic system. A lot of time is spent studying threats to political stability and social cohesion and mass movement of people and surprises. And so that's uh, an overview of really a pretty intense uh, program of study for the intelligence community. Uh, the, the director of national intelligence um, worldwide threat assessment is essentially drafted without regard to which party is in power. Uh, I watched one being drafted in the run up to the election when the um, when the outcome of that election was not known, and it did not change uh, through that process. And I think it's important to note that the intelligence community is over, overwhelmingly apolitical, uh, very similar to the scientific community. It's apolitical. It does not have a political agenda. Um, just in terms of um, the framework of climate change, I, I think an evolution needs to happen. Really, it needs to continue. Um, in viewing climate change less uh, as an environmental add-on to the actual national security issues, but more of a foundational issue of national security. The efforts of this group, uh, this forum, and the people in the audience help further that kind of uh, changing of the framework, but I think it's quite critical. Um, this is actually one of the strengths of this uh, Climate Security Action Plan. It, it, it illustrates, it shows the wide-ranging commitment to a more, um, that's needed across the entire national security enterprise uh, to address both the near-term and mid-term challenges that, of locked-in climate change, but also uh, the future trajectory of national security issues. Um, and it probably requires a broadening of what national security the national security enterprise is in the U.S. government. It's probable that we'll have to bring on people from the Department of Agriculture more increasingly, the Department of uh, the NOAA, NASA, into the national security framework as we bring particularly the scientific components of those institutions. So I. I'm, uh, before I became a national security officer, I was a scientist for, I'm still a scientist for uh, many years. And 
what is required within the intelligence community is a more robust marrying of the national security analysis with bleeding edge science from you know, what I consider to be the finest scientists in the world in our own US federal science agencies. And I mean more than just the climate scientists in NASA and NOAA and, uh, and elsewhere, but I also mean the hydrologists, uh, the ecologists, uh, people who study marine geochemistry. Uh, because I think most people are, are well aware that now that climate change affects and the way it affects people will not only be through sea level rise in hot days, but through many, if not most, of the ways that uh, societies and people act. And so I, I think it's really important to, if you're really looking at threats to regional and global stability, to bring in that more cohesive piece of the U.S. Um, science enterprise. Um, the, uh, the, the president, so, so like a lot of other issues, leadership and the agenda is set from the very top. And so then the intelligence community, because of its role to assess, strategic, to assess risk and strategic warning, uh, continues to work at threats to national security. Uh, it is helped greatly by attention from leadership. And so that means um, president who I think uh, should establish a center uh, inside the office of the director of national intelligence that brings together the expertise that I mentioned from the scientific community, the intelligence community, the larger uh, security community. Um, also need to populate the federal government with people uh, who more fully endorse climate change as, as an issue, a threat. Um, so much of how the government works is driven by personnel and, and the prioritization of personnel as policy. Um, and so uh, along with that, and I, there are a number of other smaller recommendations I, I think are really important in this document. But, but we start with the prioritization of climate change as something beyond an environmental issue, but rather uh, a, fun, a foundational uh, national security issue to be um, looked at by many different elements within the U.S. government. So thank you. Thanks a lot, Rod. Um, turning um, from, from analysis to supporting allies and partners, um, Sherry, I wanted to start just with a framing question as well for you. Um, and you spoke about these issues at length before, including in congressional testimony. Um, doing something big on climate change is often discussed as an altruistic thing. It's a, it's a moral question. It's a moral imperative, and I think it certainly is that. Um, especially on the international level, and it, and, it, and it can certainly be that. But there are also many potential strategic benefits for the U.S. to acting on climate change, vis-a-vis -vis both our allies and our competitors. Uh, so why are we not taking advantage of those strategic, potential strategic benefits, and what can be done to more fully realize those, those benefits? And there we go. You and Caitlin and John and the CCS team for putting this effort together. I know a lot of work goes into it. Let me thank Carol and the EESI team uh, for your work and leadership here. And the many military leaders, General Keyes, Vice Admiral McGinn, I know Ann Phillips and Jerry Galloway were here earlier, but there are scores and scores of them active duty and retired across the nation, actually internationally now, who recognize climate change as one of, if not the most fundamental threat of our era. Uh, and I, I say that with deep seriousness as a cold warrior who came of age worrying about the next 
bolt out of the blue nuclear attack by the Soviet Union and spent years of my life figuring out how we could deter and defend against that threat. Um, indeed, when I was a young congressional staffer, how many of you here are congressional staffers, by the way? Okay, good number. And how many of some, and how many of you work on a sort of defense or foreign policy portfolio? Okay, a few. Well, you know, I start I started out my professional career on the Senate Armed Services Committee, working for Sam Nunn in the nuclear era when we were ratifying the now uh, defunct Intermediate Range Forces INF Treaty, uh, and we were figuring out how to manage nuclear weapons and, and um, what kind of nuclear arsenal we needed to deter the Soviet Union and others. And fortunately, we won the Cold War. Nuclear weapons are still a threat, indeed, as are other weapons of mass destruction. But climate change are, is, is equal in nature uh, to that great global challenge. And so let me just tell you a couple of stories about in answer to Frank's question from my recent experiences. I just uh, came back from New York. Uh, I had dinner last night with the Dutch Prime Minister and the Chilean President of the Global Citizens Awards. They both devoted their entire remarks to climate change uh, as the most important urgent challenge that we face. And they both and many other leaders in New York are urging American action and American support, which, as you, I don't have to tell you, is sorely lacking at this moment at the federal level. Although there are a lot of good things happening at state and local levels and in the private sector um, and elsewhere. Uh, but they all see the need for American action. And what are the risks of America not leading right now? It is emboldening our adversaries and our competitors to fill the vacuum that we have created. So let me tell you a tale from the Arctic. Uh, last week I was in Oslo at the first ever NATO Arctic workshop, uh, a strategic foresight analysis gathering of NATO member countries, all 29 NATO member countries invited um, to address the opening of the Arctic and or it's sort of a new theater of operation in which NATO has to be prepared to operate. Um, why is that? Well, with sea ice retreating uh, at an, an enormously rapid rate, temperatures have already risen several degrees in the Arctic and are on a path to rise uh, twice as fast as uh, the rest of the planet. Permafrost uh, collapsing and extreme weather events beginning to happen um, in, in the Arctic as well. Uh, Russia, for example, sees an opportunity to convert its northern sea route, which hugs the longest Arctic coastline of any nation, into a toll road for transport uh, that will eventually be a major shipping route. Uh, they have, President Putin has called for increasing dramatically the tonnage shipped across the northern sea route. It's already doubled significantly in the last few years. China has declared itself to be a near Arctic stakeholder, whatever that means. There's no legal, uh, <laughs> there's no legal standing for that term. Um, and they're investing heavily with the Russians uh, at the Yamal uh, energy plant and elsewhere across, um, across the Arctic, not only with Russia, but in Iceland, Greenland, in Finland, they're helping build out a data silk road. Communications have, are sorely lacking in the Arctic uh, in terms of the domain awareness one needs to have. You know, you can't, you can't go up there and hope to have the same type of cell phone and internet connections that you would have elsewhere in the world. Uh, and as that communications is being built out, China is right there at the center of it today. Um, so the world is changing. Uh, Greenland, for example, which our 
president said he wanted to buy, um, as you may remember, um, which is increasingly independent from Denmark, uh, although still a very small one, you realize it's a small population, a vast territory, um, but changing uh, very, changing very, very rapidly. And when you look at a map, you'll see that it's really part of the North American continent, so a vital strategic interest um, to Canada and the United States and has been uh, for many years. One of my colleagues at the Wilson, at the, at the Wilson Center was up on the USS Healy uh, in the Arctic uh, this summer and they were, pre they were prepared, as an example, to, to face temperatures of 20 below, and it never dropped below 32 degrees. It never dropped below 32 degrees for the three weeks she was up on the USS Healy um, in the Arctic Circle. Um, and just two weeks ago at a, I want to get back to this very important point that Rod made here about coupling science and research with national security and intelligence analysis. That is fundamental. And for those of you who are in the early phases of your career, I'd say this is the next great frontier in research and analysis. Uh, because the coupling that's needed to make more robust the national security and intelligence analysis depends heavily on the science uh, and translating that science into practical uh, application for national security planners, um, analysts, and programmers. And just of several weeks ago, we, we uh, at a conference called Arctic Futures 2050, to sort of get at this coupling, we looked at a scenario of um, a nuclear shipping accident in the Bering Strait in 2050. Imagine what Russia has primarily nuclear powered icebreakers and ice capable vessels. It already has quite a number of them and it will have even more by 2050. China will be uh, plying the Arctic to bring energy resources back uh, to, to provide, it, provide for um, its own quest for, re for resources. So we, we looked at a scenario of a Russian nuclear icebreaker, powered icebreaker colliding with the Chinese liquid natural gas vessel that it was escorting. And what are the consequences? How would we manage it? And what do we need to understand about the science if you were to recognize today that this is possible 20 years in the future, what kind of research should we be doing today to prepare for that future and hopefully prevent it. Now, uh, at the NATO Arctic Summit, I will, I will report to you that our allies and partners across the board uh, want the U.S. back in the climate game at every level, whether it's engaged in the Paris Agreement, whether it's working with them uh, as we already do on NATO planning, uh, where I'd say you know, these types of issues are front and center, but it's at every level, particularly in diplomacy. And so let me turn to another uh, region where I think this is also very, very fundamental, and it's among the small allied states, both in the island states in the Pacific. We have the same situation, the Caribbean areas becoming um, increasingly fragile with climate-fueled risks from drought, uh, then combined with extreme weather events. In the Pacific, in particular, we now see China offering more humanitarian assistance and natural disaster relief um, when the U.S. isn't always there. Um, and that is, you know, that's important to these nations. Some of them may not exist uh, within a quarter of a century because they'll, the seas will rise or they will lack and or they will lack the fresh water to support themselves. Um, so we, are, we have a global migration challenge uh, across the board that is being fueled by climate risks, one that we will, we will need to work very closely with our allies and partners to manage. So um, to sum up this part of it, I would say my, my hopeful news is that uh, 
militaries around the world, military leaders recognize these risks and have come together in an international military council on climate and security. Um, over 20 of them now, I think we have. Frank, is that right? 28 countries. Actually. Yeah, 28 countries from every region of the world, military leaders coming together uh, who want to address the climate risks, work constructively both to assess the risks, provide the leadership, integrate climate security considerations into national security planning, and raise uh, the attention of it among global policymakers. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sherry. And now turning to, to John Conger uh, to talk t about preparing for and preventing climate impacts. Another sort of framing question for you, John, and you've probably heard this from, from us before, but on the same theme of sort of, you know, Sherry was talking about our strategic self-interest vis-a-vis our allies and our, and our adversaries. The U.S. is clearly not immune to the security risks of climate change. More devastating extreme weather events, exacerbated by climate change have in recent years cost American lives, disrupted many of our nation's critical infrastructure, including major military infrastructure, as we heard from, from many of our panelists earlier. The military recognizes this, but it doesn't seem like the U.S. is fully prepared for these potential cascading disasters that we may see going forward, from flooding to wildfires, et cetera. So what needs to happen, both on the adaptation side and the mitigation side to adequately prepare for locked-in security risks and to prevent the avoidable uh, worst-case scenarios. Okay. So I'll, I'll answer that a little bit, but given the fact that I'm batting clean up and I get to say whatever I want, um, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, speak a little bit more broadly. Um, first, I'd like, I'd like to, to put it all in the context we've heard today. We, we've heard uh, General Keyes speak from a warfighter's perspective. We've heard a panel that you had up here with over 130 years, yeah, I did the math, uh, of, of na national security experience, talking about how uh, the military is directly affected by climate change and how it affects their job today and how it's not getting better. I, th I would hazard to say, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, cite uh, General Middendorp, who's the head of our International uh, Military Council on Climate and Security, uh, who did an op-ed in uh, Politico, uh, I wanna say about a month ago, where he said, Climate change is too important to leave to the environmental ministers, uh, echoing the, the old quote about war is too important to be left to the generals. But the fact of the matter is, is that this is not an environmental issue at this point. It is past that. This is uh, not only a national security issue, it is an agriculture issue, it is an energy issue, it is a whole host of other pieces of the puzzle. But here we're talking about national security. And this issue is affecting our national security today. And so we have a responsibility to prepare in the U.S. military for what's coming. Nobody wants to be willfully blind to a problem. Nobody wants to be uh, willfully ignorant and stick your head in the sand. Well, maybe some people do. But the point is, is that they oughtn't be, and the military doesn't want to be. They don't always have the resources to do everything they need to do. Um, but, but that looking at it, knowing full well, clear-eyed, the problem is coming, you have to start taking actions. Now let me give a compliment or two to the current administration. You know, President Trump signed a bill passed by a Republican Congress in 2017 that said that climate change is a direct threat to the national security of the United States. Hey, good job. I mean, that was important to do. This, the Republicans, when the Republicans were in the majority here in 2018, they passed a whole host of sensible, pragmatic climate resilience legislation. It was important to do. They're setting the groundwork. This Congress, frankly, both in the House and the Senate, has continued to pass important legislation, moving the ball forward. But there's only so much you can do without White House active support. I think it was an important decision by the White House not to support an adversarial panel in the National Security Council to look and extricate uh, climate from national security documents. That was under active consideration. They decided not to do it. There's pushback from the DOD and from the intelligence community. 
So that's good. But active support is different from not doing harm, right? First, do no harm. First, don't be stupid, okay? Now let's move forward and get some things done. So this report literally has dozens of recommendations about how to move forward, okay? The progress that we've made is important. The progress to come is, is also important. You have to start, you have to recognize these changes are coming and then be bold. So in this report, they, we talk about a uh, climate security infrastructure initiative to actually spend money on resilience efforts within DOD, within the national security community. We have a trillion dollars worth of infrastructure at DOD, a trillion dollars worth of infrastructure. And a lot of it's vulnerable, a lot of it's old. The old what we found in some of these extreme weather scenarios was that older uh, infrastructure is more vulnerable to the changes that are coming. So recapitalizing that infrastructure, building to modern standards is important. When you build something in a smart way, it can be protected from the changes that are coming. So for example, the Department of Defense built a new strategic command headquarters at Offutt Air Force Base in Nebraska, okay? A billion dollar building. It's a big building, it has a very important job, a lot of important command and control functions there. And they built it at a higher elevation than the rest of the base. So when the floods came and the, and the Missouri River uh, swept over the levees, that building wasn't, wasn't impacted. That building wasn't damaged. Somebody thought ahead of time that it might be smart to put your most expensive building on a higher elevation and, and make it less vulnerable. On the other hand, when you spend a billion dollars on a radar facility in the middle of the Pacific Ocean in the Marshall Islands, and then you find out that within 10 years, because of sea level rise, that island is not going to be able to support human habitation, not because the island's going to be underwater, but because the aquifer is going to be uh, too intruded with salt water to be able to, to give drinking water to anybody on the island. So you don't spend your billion dollars in a place that you're not going to be able to use it anymore. Now, we could build an, a desal plant there, but that's going to be expensive, and it's going to be expensive to fuel that desal plant. But the fact of the matter is, is that having that foresight and doing things that are smart in advance is going to save us a lot of money in the long run and is going to be able to protect our interests a lot in the long run. So when uh, in the last Congress they passed a, a law that reformed how we did emergency disaster spending and they said when FEMA spends this money and in, in, in the last year there's been about 19 billion dollars in emergency spending to deal with uh, relief from hurricanes that 6% of that money was going to be withheld for pre-disaster mitigation, in other words, preventative efforts, well, that's a billion dollars. So can DOD, which spends $10 billion a year in military construction, set aside a certain percentage of its funding for uh, resilience efforts? Well, that might make some sense, especially if you're anticipating more and more of these scenarios to occur. When in the last uh, year, you, you're racking up close to a well, in excess of $10 billion in costs from damage, extreme weather, and earthquakes happen to uh, you know, our facilities and our military installations, that has direct readiness impact. So how do you start to set aside some of that money for preventative measures? So that's one of the recommendations we talk about in here. Uh, we talk about using resilient building standards. You know, California's done an excellent job of integrating seismic standards uh, due to the risk of earthquakes into its building codes. Well, given the fact that climate change is coming and it's not getting better, uh, we should be thinking about every dollar that we spend in the future to be built in a more resilient way. I mean, when you build buildings in a floodplain, you don't put the backup power in the basement anymore. You have to assume that building's going to flood. You don't put your servers in the basement anymore. There are smart things that one can do. Um, I, can, I could go at length, you know, as, as was said, I used to have responsibility for DOD installations and I can talk in more detail than, than you want to hear. Um, but let me t spend a, a moment and talk about the prevention stuff that, that Frank um, mentioned. Because one of the key things in this report and one of the key things that, that you need to, to hear from this group of military leaders, from four-star generals, from senior military leaders, y you have to understand that they are also calling 
for the United States to avoid catastrophic security futures. So what does that mean? That means as we look forward in the coming decades, there are going to be security problems that we're, we're not even uh, dealing with a, a fraction of today. You're going to have displacement of millions of people from coastal regions. You're going to have displacement of, uh, you're going to have water security issues, food security issues that are going to drive massive migration. You're going to have people's lives at risk and you're going to have significant human misery expanded around the world because of these changes. In order to avoid the conflicts that will be coming as a result of those issues, the, the human misery and humanitarian disasters that will come as a result of those issues, you have to start taking action to reduce emissions or to reduce the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. And we're technology agnostic or, or policy agnostic in this because we're security people. We see into the future and recognize the security futures that are a problem and saying you have to do something about this because it could get, you know, it, it, we were looking at cat catastrophe in the future. And so, you know, if you'd rather do it through innovation than regulation or you'd rather do it through regulation than innovation or you'd rather do all of the above, we're not taking an opinion. This is not the, the, the group of, of science uh, experts. This is a group of security experts and saying you have to do something to prevent and you have to start now. You know, Denny, I'll, I want to close. I want to quote Denny because he, he's, he's always very quotable. Um, you know, Denny said earlier today, it doesn't get any better without us doing something about it. I, I'm, I'm going to be way more jaded, cynical, and pessimistic than that. I, I don't think it gets better. I, you know, seriously, it doesn't get better. Where it's getting worse. And if we did everything we were supposed to do, it'd still get worse, just less worse. Okay? And, and the fact of the matter is, is that we are on a really bad pathway to uh, uh, security futures that are untenable. And we have to do what we can to avoid them. We have to mitigate the changes that we know are inevitable. And we have to do something to avoid the changes that are catastrophic. And on that really high note, I think I'll finish. Thanks so much, John. And, and as I was looking um, through the, the bios of, of, of all today's speakers earlier, um, uh, I noticed that across the two panels, there were two and a quarter centuries worth of experience in the security community. Um, that's not a commentary on anyone's age, by the way. So um, it's collectively all together. But uh, I emphasize that just to underline John's point that you know here is a, uh, is a group, and, and there are 64 uh, senior military, national security, also intelligence leaders that have signed on to this report. Uh, so it goes beyond the military space. But and I, I haven't totaled up, you know, the years of experience in that in that group of 64. But here's a group of people with with uh, a deep, deep well of experience in, in the security space who's, who's warning us, as John has, uh, just, has just warned us, of potentially catastrophic uh, climate futures for our security and, uh, and that we need to do something bold about it. So I think, uh, I think that means something and that means something important. And, and I just, I, I wanna go to the, the floor now uh, for, for questions. We have uh, about you know, 20, 25 minutes, half an hour. Uh, Admiral McGinn, I know you have to go a little bit early, so if you see Admiral McGinn leaving, it's not because he's bored or uh, doesn't want to take your questions. He, he has to go to a very important meeting after this, but um, why don't we start with questions? Okay, so let me see. In the back, all the way in the back. Hi, I'm Stephanie Ooze from NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And I'm, I think this sounds great, a lot of what you're suggesting about creating you know, a panel of scientists to inform um, security experts. And I'm wondering how likely you think it is that this recommendation to create these new Office on Climate Security and to bring scientists in, how likely do you think that is? Rod? Uh, thank you uh, <clears throat> for your comment. Um, I actually think it's quite likely, irrespective of the party that would come in, 
uh, in the next election. I, I say that because we have had some of those conversations already, uh, or we did when I was a sitting uh, member of the of, of government. And so uh, I'll just mention some of those relationships already exist, but they're ad hoc and almost personality based. Oh, I know a person at NASA Goddard. I know a person in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, so really this is a way to more formalize it and add the convening power of you know, the national security uh, enterprise. Um, you know, one of the side effects of something like this is to also, and, and this comes from years of talking to uh, scientists in our federal agencies, is for the national security community to better inform research, original research, by the science agencies. And so they seem to value contributing original knowledge to what is important to the national security community. I would just add as an example, I, I know that um, the Air Force today is hiring in Air Force Weather, their meteorologist department, they're hiring their first climate scientist because they recognize that this is important. And I, I'm sure there are more examples out there as well. All right. Um, I'll, I'll be, uh, I'll try not to be too cynical. I, I um, so, so, so some of these are more likely than others. If you look through the dozens of recommendations, some are easier than others, right? Um, I think the challenge that we have here is that we are looking for leadership from the White House in order to galvanize action across the entire federal enterprise. And that can happen. We've seen it happen. But uh, you have to have the president has to be interested enough in the particular issue to make that happen. And so... Um, will this president do that? Well, we've heard the cynicism, and so it might be a harder sell, right? Um, but he's signed legislation saying that this is a threat, so maybe there's a chance. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm reminded at the, of the, the line from, I forget the movie, where Jim Carrey was told he had a one in a million shot, and he says, well, you're saying there's a chance. Um, I think there's a chance. But I think, uh, and it's been written, t this document has been written um, to be something that any administration could adopt. It is not a partisan document in any way. And this administration could easily find this totally consistent with what they wanted to do. Um, it's just a question of, uh, you know, uh, whether it's uh, high enough on their priority list to make it happen. In the... Uh, Tea House of the August Moon, there's a line that says, pain makes one think, thought makes one wise, wisdom makes life bearable. Mother Nature is going to get more and more painful. So we can decide what we can do to prevent that to the extent that we can and to be more resilient in the face of that pain caused not just in the United States, but around the world. I will, uh, uh, I will uh, disagree a little bit with John in saying that there are so many things that we can get better in the face of this challenge. Think about the challenge of climate change as a wonderful, wonderfully riveting uh, bunch of packages, wrapping paper, and inside that challenge are tremendous opportunities. Opportunities to completely transform not just the United States but the global uh, energy portfolio. To have benefits at the local, regional, and of course global level by that transformation. Creating jobs, creating a higher quality of life, uh, creating better water, uh, better oceans. There's a lot of goodness here that we can in fact make better and if we say, hey, let's focus on climate change, but every dimension of it. And uh, as Rod said, bringing in all kinds of different uh, scientific disciplines to this, in addition to meteorologists and climate scientists, of course, and intel specialists, but we can, in fact, make things better in so many areas. And just very quickly, when we started this process with the group, 
the mission was actually quite clear. The mission was from a, from a clear-eyed security perspective, what kinds of policies are necessary to deal with those security consequences of climate change. We explicitly didn't put a, pol a political lens on it, um, which might be a little bit unusual for a Washington policy document, but we really wanted to lay out what we thought needed to happen, the scale of ambition that needed to happen, irregardless of, of who's in the White House. And so, so that's, that's really what, what the document is. More questions? Right here. Anna McGinn with EESI. Sorry to steal the floor since we're one of the sponsors, but um, you've alluded to this um, a little bit, but I want to draw it out a little bit more. Um, there's been a lot of talk about decarbonizing the economy, different sectors, and increasingly conversation about sectors that are really tough to decarbonize, and I'm well aware that the military is one of those, but I'm wondering to what extent the report addresses decarbonization or mitigation, decreasing greenhouse gas emissions, um, and whether or not it does address it, any opinions you all have on that would be great. We address it uh, in very, very general terms. And we don't try to say, hey, we're energy experts or, you know, um, technology experts. We just simply say that there are experts and expertise and things that are being done that can be accelerated and done, done even better. Uh, but uh, we are, as, as has been said many times, we're, our expertise for this report is on national security. But clearly, uh, there are so many opportunities out there that uh, lie in the, uh, in the energy portfolio area, let, let's say energy efficiency, et cetera, that, we, that are in fact underway to an extent. But with uh, creating the kind of uh, national federal government infrastructure that this report recommends, it's going to automatically go to solution sets. When you start talking about problems, we're going to say, well, what can we do? What can we encourage? If we have a representative, uh, uh, a senior representative from DOE that is uh, addressing climate change, clearly that's going to manifest itself through the national labs and, and universities, et cetera. And, and as uh, Admiral McGinn uh, mentioned, it is general, um, but we do have, I think it's page 31, um, we essentially call for something we call a, a climate security prevention policy. So we say embrace an economy-wide climate security prevention policy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions at a scale necessary for avoiding catastrophic security consequences. So that speaks to the Admiral's point. You know, we, and John's point earlier, which is, this is a group of security experts. We recognize, based on the, f the, the analysis we've seen, both the scientific analysis, a lot of the foresight analysis and scenario uh, exercises that have happened on this issue, both, both publicly and privately, um, that we, we may have some significant security consequences with even a, a 1.5 degree world. And so, uh, so the recommendation here is do something big to reduce the sk those emissions, but we're agnostic on how you get there, and hopefully, you know, that's the job of, of, of uh, more experienced than uh, people from, than we from are. From a, a DOD perspective, something that General Keyes and I have been wishing for our whole careers, and that is the nation needs to build a solar-powered airplane so we only fly in the daytime in, in good weather. <laughs> so, for Frank, could I just add one more thought? I think it's important to recognize as you think about you know, energy efficiency or renewable energy at DOD that, that lowers the emissions uh, profile. You're going to decide what you're going to do in the national security enterprise based on national security concerns. And sometimes that means you're going to have more emissions. It does. Um, I think that a lot of the stories that characterize DOD's emissions, um, you know, are make DOD look uh, worse because it's big. DOD is a large organization with two million people and it, it's got, it's a huge industrial enterprise and if you unpack it, you find, okay, so most of the, uh, you know, emissions that we have are based on fuel and most of the fuel emissions are based on aircraft and those are the wide body aircraft, not the fighter airplanes that do most of the emissions. And then you say, okay, what else has wide body aircraft uh, that fly all over the world? Well, it's the airline industry. So you look at American Airlines and it's almost as much as DOD alone. 
And if you look at the American airline industry, it dwarfs DOD. And if you look at the world airline industry, it even dwarfs that. So as one decides where you're going to put your control volume and you look around and you say, here's where I'm going to analyze, just be careful that you're not um, distorting the picture that you're looking at. There's a lot to be done. But when you're dealing with 1% to 2% of American emissions and then America is 15% of the world, you're only going to have so much impact if you focus on DOD emissions. You should look everywhere, by all means. Individual action is important. Um, but, but be aware what your effect is for what, the, uh, what you're pushing for. OK, where's the microphone? Oh, here we are. Um, right, uh, right over here on the corner, Michael. Thank you. Uh, my name is Michael Clare. I have a question uh, for you, Sherry. I'm repeating what was asked earlier about the Arctic and geopolitics. Uh, you know, last month or so, Mike Pompeo spoke at the Arctic Council. And historically, the Arctic Council and uh, US officials in general have spoken of the Arctic as a zone of peace and cooperation. And I know you've advocated that. But he, in his speech at the Arctic Council, uh, didn't mention climate change, but said the sea ice is melting and this was going to increase competition in the area. And he called for a stiffening of American military uh, capacity in the region. So h how do you see this playing out? Will the Arctic remain a zone of peace, or do you see it becoming an area of military, of geopolitical competition and military competition? All right, well, Michael, uh, you know, the, the Arctic is still a vast and remote place, and the, the, the risks in the near term are one more likely of an accident uh, or an oil spill. Um, and the hope is that miscalculation or lack of transparency about the situation will enable forces, first responders, to work together. But there is no doubt that the competition among adversaries, China, Russia, and the United States in the region is growing. Um, in the first order, I th in the first instance, it's economic competition. Both China and Russia see opportunities to monetize the resources of the Arctic. Um, but that's really true for every Arctic nation and for the, many of the Arctic Council observers. They want access to the resources, whether it's fishing grounds that are moving northward, um, or energy resources. There's thought to be the greatest, um, the, the greatest store of fossil fuels on the planet in the Arctic. Now, that's at odds with trying to decarbonize. Um, and, you know, so, th and, and uh, if we move in the right direction, the value of those won't be as great. And it's still very complicated and expensive uh, to work, work in the Arctic. Russia is uh, militarizing its portion of the Arctic, re rebuilding uh, military bases it had, um, reinstating Arctic capability that um, it had let lag after the Cold War. Um, sometimes Russia boasts more of a game than it actually delivers on. And one of my personal greatest concerns is that historically lax Russian environment and safety practices. Think of not only Chernobyl, but think of just in the last few years, there have been nuclear submarines lost, there have been explosions, there have been accidents. I mean, this, you know, this is a, a repeating pattern um, in Russian management of both its nuclear forces and other hazardous situations. Um, I'm deeply concerned about those type of situations where in the vast Arctic, where the communications are already not very good and there's lack of transparency about what could happen. Anyone who's, you know, seen the Chernobyl series, you know, knows or remembers Chernobyl like I do, remembers that, you know, they weren't forthcoming about what was really happening. So there's a lot we may not know when an incident occurs. We may not have the facts. Um, right away, so we won't know what lives or what 
part of the planet are being put at risk. And an oil spill in Arctic waters could be very, very complicated. Uh, it could make Exxon Valdez or even Deepwater Horizon look easy. Um, and it won't be confined to one country's waters because of the way the circulation patterns work in the Arctic. It's almost certainly going to be a cross-border spill with global, imp global implications. So those are some of the things I worry about. I also worry, I also am concerned about increasing Chinese foreign direct investment um, and other types of investment and influence across the region um, that will give it a, fo a foothold not only uh, for economic resources but for global influence in the future. I have to run. Uh, I would ask that, and we would ask, that you take this conversation with you into your personal and professional lives, families, uh, co-workers, uh, other forums. It's, it's our problem to solve, and we can solve it. We can mitigate it, if you will, but uh, keep the conversation going, especially if uh, you happen to be on a congressional staff, committee staff, personal staff, or whatever, getting the right kind of political will to uh, unleash the, uh, the, the good forces of America and American leadership is what we have to do. Thank you very much. Thanks, Admiral. Also, I want to say, because Michael won't say it, um, he just published a book, All Hell Breaking Loose, um, The Pentagon's Perspective on Climate Change. So uh, if you have a chance, uh, take a look at that. We can take more questions. Over here. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, my name is Jessie. I work for Abigail Spanberger. And um, this is a top priority for her. And I really appreciate the report that outlines recommendations. But it all is directed at the executive branch. And um, some of it aligns with legislation that's being discussed here, particularly around uh, more information that DNI can put together on the security risks associated with climate. But I'm wondering either if you can directly send to me or circulate more broadly uh, congressional recommendations that people here today can act on um, and uh, yeah and if you have legislation that's already being discussed like endorsements or positions of those that would also be very useful thank you and in line with bringing it into my day job that would be perfect great thanks for the question um, there are no congressional recommendations in here uh, because of our tax status as a nonprofit organization, but um, but certainly we um, you know we do a lot of congressional education, as you know. John, I don't know if you want to take um, this question yourself, uh, given J John does a lot of our congressional work. So you can come up and talk to us after we're done. Yeah, Jesse, let me just say I uh, you know I I know Congressman Spamberger well. Testified before her at Foreign Affairs. I think what she's what she and the other. Um, leading freshmen, national security, um, Congress, men and women, particularly the women, are doing are great. I love the women, the, the five women in the Service First Women's Victory Fund. They're, they're killing it um, in really good ways. That's, you know, changing leadership in our country. Um, and, you know, all of these types of recommendations can be converted into congressional direction. And that's, um, so there's an opportunity to follow up and, and make, things, make things happen. Yeah, I'll say anything that the administration can do, Congress can tell them to do. Yeah, and, and also just for informational purposes, I mean, there is a, a, a piece of legislation, I think, uh, in, in progress right now um, related to climate and intelligence assessments that I believe has some pretty strong bipartisan support. Um, I think it was introduced by Congressman Heck, and so um, there's stuff like that that's happening at the moment, um, but as Sherry said, you know, there, can, there could be a lot more and these can be converted. Um, why don't we take a couple questions at a time? Um, we still have about 10, 15 minutes, so, um, so we have a lot of time for everybody. Um, we have um, here Mark, um, and then, uh, and then the, the hand to the left there. Why don't we take two questions and then go from there. I'm 
Mark Kodak, a retired Army headquarters civilian. So my question is mostly to John. I, well, Sherry might be able to offer one. So while the, the plan talks about the supply chain in the context of critical infrastructure support, what about the defense industrial base and equipment? So there are tens or not hundreds of thousands of suppliers who make equipment for the Department of Defense. And, and particularly within a defense industrial base, presumably that's the most important piece. Climate change can affect them, and they're all over the place. They're not just in the United States, they're also outside the United States. How do we sort of bring, how do we get DOD to sort of bring them into the conversation about vulnerabilities? Because if, even if you can get it from a transportation standpoint to you, if they can't make it because of energy or uh, water disruptions locally, that's going to affect the ability of DOD, not necessarily immediately because they may have uh, supplies elsewhere, but over the longer term, there may be some critical holes in what we can produce in order to be able to give soldiers, airmen, and Marines sort of the equipment and make sure that it works when they need it. Thanks, Mark. Hi, my name is Michael Ellis. I'm the training in the Hands Office. So we've talked about doing a lot of things. And to do all those things, we need people to do them. Do we have people with the education and the skills to do them? Or at a minimum, do we have the types of institutions that can train those people up? And if we don't, how does DOD fit into that solution? Thanks. You John, you want to take? Yeah, I mean, they're, All right. they can take there, There's one. a recommendation in, in on training on here, on training uh, installation folks and other folks on on climate change. So, so that we didn't we didn't lose that. Um, we, we are cognizant of the fact that that those programs need to occur on the supply chain stuff. Um, yes, it's a big problem. The question is how how wide do we draw this? Do we talk about the defense industry? Not especially in here, but obviously the defense industry has an impact on the, on the the military. Um, I think that as you look at the international supply chain in particular, it's not just you know, w water shortfalls and such, but the possible uh, instability in certain parts of the world where we get, you know, p potentially get critical parts. Uh, even if they're not adversaries, adversaries uh, they might be allies, but that um, instability in certain parts of the world due to climate stresses might undermine our ability to, to, to continue to get those uh, critical materials or, cri or critical supply chain elements. So, uh, yeah, we, we have to look at that uh, more broadly. Thank you for the research and work that you've been doing, not only in your career in federal service, but since then. Uh, it's, it's, ter it's terrific. And uh, thank you for highlighting the supply chain vulnerabilities from climate change of the defense industrial base. I think it's an under-examined area. Uh, I think there's room for congressional direction to DOD to examine those supply chain risks um, because it, it's, it, to me it's a bit like the concern a few years ago about vulnerabilities to rare earth, um, rare earth uh, minerals that you know we would face a supply chain risk because we only had one or two sources and maybe some of them were in China. Well we have some of the same problems here. We, we're sourcing materials from China or from parts of India that are consistently flooded or parts of the Philippines or Vietnam um, and multiple conflict and environmental stressors. And it, it should be, it's worthy of, of deeper examination. Thanks. And on the question of um, are there people with experience that can help do these things that we, we asked for in the report, um, well, first of all, I can think about, I can think of 64 off the top of my head. Uh, that might be good who signed this report that, that it could have some experience moving some of this. But honestly, I think um, over the past, I mean, for example, I mean, the Department of Defense uh, started thinking about environmental security um, with Sherry's leadership in the 90s very seriously um, back then, um, starting in, I think, 1993 when, when, you, when you joined the department. Um, and then also it started looking really, started looking seriously at climate change in the latter half of the George W. Bush administration. And so I think there's quite a bit of knowledge uh, within the Department of Defense, certainly within, the, you know, also some of the other departments and agencies and the science agencies. Uh, they just need to be channeled. And, uh, and I think there are people that could easily rise uh, to the level of, of some of the positions in institutions that we're talking about in this, in this, uh, in this report. Um, honestly, I don't think it would be that hard to find people. Um, if the structures were in place, I think something like this could happen very quickly and with the expertise that was, that was necessary.
Caitlin here, and then, um, yeah, right there. Hi, I'm Joseph Cavaretta. I'm on the EESI board. My question is something that Sherry referred to, uh, the arms race. If you look at this from the perspective of an arms race, how do our climate security initiatives stack up against what China and Russia are doing? Not only am I going to speak as non-panelists, I'm also not going to ask a question. I just want to make a comment that we've talked a lot about uh, the role of the military, and I think we have a tendency to think that uh, when we talk about climate security or climate and national security, that it's a Department of Defense issue. Um, but this report, uh, it looks at a number of departments and agencies. And if we really are going to prepare and prevent for these risks, we do need, as Secretary, former Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis said, a whole of government response. So you have to have your diplomacy, development, and defense departments working together, working with your intelligence agencies, working with your scientists. So I just want to underscore what the way in which we're defining security and the importance of that for truly being prepared. Thanks, Caitlin. And um, who wants to take the, the first question and, and any responses to Caitlin? Okay, on, um, on China, uh, what, what concerns me deeply is, um, is the technological leads that China is advancing in key areas where it's ne necessary for us to be globally competitive, and that's in quantum computing and AI and 5G and um, other types of technologies. They all have application in climate security, but they have much broader application. I think that's a fundamental risk in our society right now, and it's, it's becoming particularly acute because we're in, we are actually decoupling our economy from China right now under President Trump and President Xi, we, we are, the trade war and other actions are decoupling our economies which had been moving closer together. We had been, I mean, just in the area we're talking about energy and climate change, we had been collaborating heavily with China. Uh, we pulled back from that because of the real risks of their, you know, of their cyber and other attacks and their stealing our, our intellectual property and, and um, so, I mean, those are real concerns, but at the same time, the we have to really be clear-headed about who's going who's gonna to be winning and losing in each of these fields as our economies historically um, decouples. Uh, and, and so I, I think that the technologies to decarbonize, China's leading in a lot of the technologies to decarbonize society. It doesn't mean that they've decarbonized yet, um, but they have a lot more, let's say, electric buses like it, you know, gl nationally than we do, just as a small example. They've done a lot more with solar. They're still very heavy on coal, so they're kind of doing all of the above at a very heavy rate, their population. So their, as to their climate leadership in the, in the military in particular, um, I, I, you know, I, I don't have great, in, I, don't, I don't have any particular insight on their programs. I think the U.S. is probably ahead in, in many ways on thinking about the analytics of it, but I think there's a lot of technology advances and innovations that are occurring across, across China in many sectors now that is deeply troubling for, Amer for the American way of life. Thanks, Sherry. And, and on Caitlin's point, you know, if you look at the, the plan, um, particularly in the section on preparing and preventing for climate impacts actually, and also on, on support for our allies and partners, um, we call for a regional, major diplomatic effort um, uh, called regional climate security initiatives uh, that would uh, mostly be driven by, say, in this case, the State Department and USAID making, making investments and also, you know, in partnerships with, with others outside the government. Uh, and so, and we also even, I think, quite um, uh, boldly call for a new uh, structure within the State Department to deal specifically with climate security issues. So there's a lot in there. Um, there's a lot of pages, so um, so <laughs> if you can get through them, they're worth they're worth reading through. Uh, I think we have time for a couple more questions, uh, and then we'll wrap up. One more question, actually, and then we'll wrap up. I'm being told to wrap up. <laughs> um, 
Way in the back. Hi, so my name is Blake Height. I'm at Senator Kane's office and a uh, Navy veteran that's experienced the flooding in the Hampton Roads area and down Camp Lejeune, so it's all very relevant to me. Um, but I'm wondering what the effects on migration in the Southern Americas are and what specific role the United States might play in providing uh, security solutions and stability operations there. Jerry? Okay, well, um, you know, the migration uh, from in the Western Hemisphere is fueled by many factors. Um, some of it is political instability. I mean, th think about Venezuela. Um, some of it is, you know, the historic um, narco trafficking and other corruption in other countries. And exacerbating all of that as a threat multiplier is the increasing environmental fragility of the region from climate stressors. Um, you know, the glaciers, the hand Indian glaciers are melting. Other areas are becoming more dry. Other areas are more racked by extreme weather events and hotter temperatures. The coffee crop, which is the fundamental part of the economy in many of the countries, um, is, sh is shifting and no longer as robust. And many of these areas are historically, you know, are primarily agriculture and agricultural. And food insecurity is becoming a major issue as well as sort of livelihoods as the ability to um, farm, uh, fish, and herd in traditional ways um, is changing be as the climate changes. I mean, you could just read the studies now. For example, you know, it, within another couple decades, London's going to have the same temp climate that Barcelona has today. Um, so there are all these global shifts going on, and countries that are less able to be resilient and adapt are going to have more people who are, and so the migration we're seeing into the U.S. is fueled in part by that, not only by that. And sometimes it's completely, it's hard to disentangle. What should we do about it? Well, if we're clear-eyed and we recognize it, we should direct our, our foreign assistance and our aid and our diplomatic efforts to help find solutions in place. For example, if these historic agricultural shifts are going on in, um, in temperature, what how do you climate-proof your, your agriculture sector for that particular region? Um, and there's a lot of research going on um, to enable those shifts to occur um, and those transitions. But many of these countries will need help um, and we haven't even talked about the, uh, the uh, destruction of the Amazon rainforest. Um, but also at the same time, um, many of the carbon removal technologies that we need to actually meet, to avoid catastrophe require, for example, reforestation and other areas that could make some of these countries much more robust and resilient. So, and a lot of that's being discussed in New York today, uh, this week, and there's a lot more information coming out now about more robust carbon removal technologies that will be needed across the board to help us, not, not only as we decarbonize the current energy system, but we're going to need a, a much more set of robust um, technologies that are both natural and uh, man-made to help address carbon removal. Thanks, Sherry. Rod? And just to add 20 seconds to that, uh, just like in other parts of this story, look to what the science says. And there's a growing body of academic evidence that uh, drought in the Northern Triangle of Central America is affecting food security, as Sherry said, but also labor. And those are the underpinnings of stability in, in particularly those countries but broadly countries worldwide. And so the, it, it is uh, increasingly clear that in our own backyard, climate change is having a national security effect. Thanks, Rod. Um, that is all the, the time we have. I want to thank the panelists here today. So everybody, please, if you'll join me in, in them a round of applause. Um,
I want to thank the previous panelists, General Keyes. I want to thank John Conger, who really, along with Carol and the team at ESI and Amory, um, they really did all the work. I just showed up, so I want to thank uh, them for putting this on. I want to thank the Henry M. Jackson Foundation for supporting this and the David Rockefeller Fund uh, and the Congressman for, for sponsoring the office. Uh, if you don't have a report in hand, as John said, we did have to sacrifice at least a tree, but it was an old growth, I hope, but um, to, to print them out. So we printed out many. So if you want to take some back to your organizations and back to your congressional office or wherever, uh, please take some additional ones that are out there on the table. Um, and also, I don't want to carry them back to the office. So, um, but please take those, and, uh, and uh, thanks for, very much for coming, and uh, hope to see you again soon.